welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for April the 7th, 2021. Do I have a motion to an executive session? Yeah, Only session. Mr. President, pursuant to the general provisions of Article 3, 305, and 3-104, I move for the board to meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointed employees over whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to negotiations, to consult with counsel, and to perform an administrative function. And this is regular closed session. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. We'll be back at 6 o'clock. Good evening. Welcome back to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting for April the 7th, 2021. Can we stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a uh, we have an agenda to have a motion to approve and amend. Make a motion to open open session. Second. Uh, I'd like to also uh, make it a movement that we go back. Motion into, is that on the floor? And amend it. Just to open the session. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All, all those in favor? Five zero. Oh. Oh, motion to amend. I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda at uh, 12.0 to include reconvening and closed session. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. You've had a chance to review the minutes. Can I make a motion to accept the amended agenda? S second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carries 5-0. Okay now? Yes, sir. Approval of minutes for March the 10th, 2021. Open executive, everybody had a chance to read them. Mm -hmm. Have any corrections or things or approval? I have a motion. I have a motion to accept the open and, clo open and executive close for March 10th, 2021. A second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Carries 5-0. Okay. Dr. Kane, recognitions? We do, we do have one recognition this evening. My helper tonight. Thank you. We have one special recognition this evening. We have the Energizer Bunny, and so we're gonna ask our sponsors to please come in. Greetings. Always good for our sponsors to be here. And our recognition this evening is for Miss Ardina Hamilton. She is our Energizer Bunny. And our sponsors are going to come forward as well while I read these wonderful comments presented by Mr. Kentop, your supervisor. At Arise Academy, Ms. Hamilton serves as a special education teacher, making sure that IEPs and 504 plans are implemented in our classrooms to help students succeed. Ms. Hamilton also serves as our testing coordinator for all state testing and at times fills in as acting administrator on campus. Wonderful. Ms. Hamilton goes above and beyond with her students, following up with them and their families at home, constantly communicating information between staff and families, and generally being a go-to adult for many of the students. While doing this during the day, Ms. Hamilton is also continuing her education uh, uh, through graduate courses, representing Queen Anne's County Public Schools on a state works, uh, work group for school climate and serving on the Education Equity Committee for the county. The 2021 school year started with Arise Academy temporarily having a staff assigned to address a need at another school. 
and Ms. Hamilton, who also has certification in that teacher's area, volunteered to teach the course on top of her other responsibilities. This expanded into the second semester as we were not able to secure a substitute for that particular teacher. Ms. Hamilton has now picked up a total of four courses in that area while still keeping up her other responsibilities. We're grateful to have her uh, have a staff full of people at Arise Academy who are willing to go above and beyond for students. Ms. Hamilton is leading the way with all she has taken on this year and she is truly deserving of the Energizer Bunny Award. Congratulations. And we do have your supervisor, Mr. Kentop, come on forward. Is there anything that you'd like to say? <laughs> She's too tired. Right, right. She's been doing everything. I, I, I do say thank you um, to Mr. Kentop for recognizing all that, that we do as a team and recognizing the work that I put in. It, it's a pleasure because everything we do um, is for the kids. So wherever I can step in and be of service, I'm willing and ready to do so. And it shows tonight. So thank you very, very much. And on behalf of our sponsors and all of us, the board members, congratulations, Ms. Hamilton. Thank you. board members involvement. Tammy, you'd like to start off? Sure. On Tuesday, March 9th, I was involved with a Zoom meeting with the Chamber of Commerce, as well as Adam Tolley and other key stakeholders discussing the new culinary arts program, which Queen Anne's County Public Schools, in partnership with Chesapeake College, will be offering beginning in the fall. Um, 10 students, five from Queen Anne's County High School and five from Ken Allen High School. The course provides instruction into food service and hospitality industries, also offering uh, an opportunity for the serve safe credential. The purpose of the Zoom meeting was to inform businesses of the opportunity and provide details about the Maryland Youth Apprenticeship Program, which has been a long time coming and I'm and personally grateful that it's happening. Also on March 9th, I stopped by the Queen Anne's County High School to lend my support to the Queen Anne's County Retired Personnel Association's donation drive to collect uh, classroom supplies for the Judy, Judy Center. And I understand uh, from Mr. Richard McNeil that the event was very successful. The superintendent search is still continuing. The men, men, members have interviewed seven candidates. The first round of interviews were held in March. The second round will be conducted next week and updates are coming. Thank you. Um, my involvement was mostly virtual for some of the sports things. Um, JB, of course, I was able to attend all so far, whether in person or virtual or standing outside, sitting in my car outside of a fence watching. Um, and so far, JV football, Queen Anne's County High School is undefeated. Yay. <laughs> um, varsity, I couldn't view all of them, but the ones I could tune in for, uh, their season was turning around um, just before they went into quarantine. So hopefully they come out fighting for their last home game. Um, and I tried to see as many games as I could in other sports, but the live feed is not that great. Not all schools offer it, so it was challenging. It's been challenging for the parents as well and frustrating. So that's something that perhaps we need to look into because sometimes our equipment wasn't even keeping up with the game. The action was here and the camera was still there. So you're not sure what's happening. Um, and it was also nice to see mini bands out at some of the, all the sporting events, giving them a chance to do some live performances as well, since they've also been on hold like some of the other activities this year. Um, so even though some of the, the JV games were away, 
we still attended. Some schools allowed us to stand at the fence outside, some didn't, some we had to stay in our cars. It varies from school to school, but like I said, not all school has that live stream ability, so um, I felt more comfortable as a parent being there. Um, and I, I voiced my concern earlier, at least two games we saw an ambulance go out, so um, I'm one of those parents that's there, whether I can be in there or not, just in case. Um, but it, it's at least nice to see that the kids are playing again. So, oh, that's mine. Oh, well, uh, we're continuing our tours of the schools, and that's been really interesting. Um, really impressed with how quickly the the super the. Um, principals and all the teachers and the kids have adjusted, you know, to going back a uh, full day hybrid um, and so appreciative of the principals, you know, wel welcoming us and, and giving us a picture into what they're doing. Um, seems as if what we hear at every single school is a sub issue. So I'm hoping that we can maybe do some work around that. Um, I haven't attended any games. I have attended a couple practices because you can watch from afar with binoculars and it's really great. Um, to see them, you know, running and playing and jumping and just doing the things that they should do outside. So that's that was nice. I went to one at Queen Anne's County High School and one at Kent Island. So that was nice. Yeah, okay. So as Helen mentioned, uh, we are continuing our school visits. Um, as she said, it's it's really been an enlightening experience. I'm seeing the great things that the teachers are doing in the classroom and how they're juggling, you know, kids on the screen and and kids in the uh, in the classroom. Uh, but very impressed with everybody, the principals uh, and the teachers. Um, I did want to uh, take a second because I know we're going to be. Um, the second read of the equity equity policy, education equity policy, is set for later on tonight. But I was looking at the uh, presentations that'll be starting after public involvement, and I see the first one is educational equity, and then another one uh, goes into the extended works, and and they all mention the equity. Um, uh, education equity section of the Comar. So just to kind of put things into perspective before we get into that, since I might have a ch uh, chance later on, I don't want to interrupt anybody. So just so everybody knows, they, the Comar does require us to have an equity policy. And probably the main objective of the uh, equity, education equity policy is to, it's twofold. Number one, to raise achievement of all of our students and number two, to narrow and eventually eliminate the uh, achievement gap between our minority students and the rest of the student body. So if you look at the Comar, that, that really is the main objective of those two. So while we were doing our visits, we were, we've were we been talking to principals. Um, Dr. Kane's been with us. We've talked to teachers. Uh, I've talked to parents you know, in the community, stakeholders in the community. Uh, the first read of the policy, the proposed policy, got a lot of attention on the internet. There were a lot of posts on, to the website. Uh, I reviewed most of those. I think there was upwards of 170 the last time I looked. And uh, one thing I can say for sure, 100%, is that everybody wants to see the achievement gap narrowed and eventually eliminated. We want to see our minority st uh, students um, uh, achieving as high as everybody else. And we want to see everybody raised up in achievement. So I think that's a, a great thing. That's um, something we should be proud of as a county and as a school system. <coughs> now, excuse me. How we go about doing that in the broad terms, you know, what's the plan, how we're going to meet that objective, uh, that's where people begin to differ. Some people believe that uh, the equity policy that's going to be implemented and has been implemented by the, uh, the state mandated to the districts is the, you know, the, the panacea that's going to cure the, the uh, equity gap or the uh, achievement gap. Um, others believe that uh, it, it should, we should have an equity policy, but a little more beefed up and you know, uh, borrowing from other theories and that kind of thing. Others have mentioned that you know we've got already got an equality policy. We've got a non-discrimination and inequality, access to all the school resources. Why do we need an equity policy? So we're going to have an equity policy because Maryland's requiring us to do it. And, uh, and I think the solution is going to be somewhere uh, in the middle. 
Um, but I do believe that uh, uh, everybody has raised very good points. And I think the key thing to focus on is we got the same objective. We have the same goal in mind. Uh, it's doable. It's, it'll be difficult. But I think with the, the support that we've seen from the community um, and how you know we go about doing it is, is going to be the, the challenge. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to the presentations that we're going to be uh, having tonight. So thank you. Starting off, I'd like to send my condolences to the Draper family. Elizabeth Draper Bryce passed away a couple weeks ago. She was a former board member and also the only uh, member of Queen Anne's County has been the past president of MABE. So I want to tell that family, you know, we appreciate what she did for us. Also, uh, last night we were scheduled to meet with the commissioners for our budget, and that was rescheduled for the tomorrow night at 530. Uh, we'll be doing that then. And I also must say it's been a pleasure the last couple days to get stuck behind school buses. It's, uh, <laughs> I like to see them on the road. Never thought I'd say that, but uh, it's a pleasure to see all those yellow buses running around and uh, doing a good job and everybody you know, getting back to normal as close as we can. So thank you and everybody for you know, working with everything, both staff, parents, students, and everybody. Thank you. Dr. King. Absolutely. So I've had my normal PAZAM state superintendent meetings. Of course, we continue to meet with Maryland Health Department each Friday. We didn't meet this past Friday. I continue to have my meetings with the Eastern Shore superintendents, and uh, they've been very productive meetings, been able to keep on top of what's happening in all of the Eastern Shore uh, districts. We also have had um, a multicultural advisory committee meeting with Chesapeake College Task Force on a achieving academic equity and excellence for black boys with the State Department. And our presentation for that will happen next month. It was scheduled for April, the end of April, but it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna happen in May. So that'll be great. And we'll be presenting to state superintendents within the next week or two. Uh, also, we were we had the great, great pleasure of uh, distributing or visiting, doing school visits for the Teacher of the Year finalists, and that was that's always a lot, a lot of fun. So we were able to do that. It's been a, a good time, and we are so looking forward to Friday, the 16th, where we ha I think Friday is the 16th, where we have yes, got thumbs right. up, where we have the um, sort of recognitions for the Teacher of the year and for the employees of the year. So we are really, really looking forward to those, those events. It's going to be a lot of fun. I have some great news and, and I'm going to, yep, come on. My team is coming in. Some really, really super great news. We applied for Queen Anne's County under the leadership of two of our supervisors that are coming forward right now. Uh, Amy Smith, who supervises math and Michael Page, who supervises science and PE health and environmental education wrote a grant it was a competitive grant for one million dollars and we just got the word or at least we found the word on the governor's website this afternoon that we have been awarded that one million dollar grant come on forward a lot a lot of work and well done, well done. So if you wanna take a couple of minutes, just a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about what that grant is about. It enhances our work around mathematics and gifted and talented and environmental ed, which is our absolute love. Please take a moment. So, sorry. Oh. Somebody's thinking. I guess for the record again, I'm Amy Smith, mathematics supervisor and gifted and talented supervisor. Um, good evening, board members and Dr. Kane, executive team. We had the pleasure of writing this and my portion of the grant really focused around some summer engagement opportunities to re-engage students over the next several summers. It's not just a this summer, it's over the course of the next three years that we'll have the ability to bring in students to help have them engage in STEAM camps. So there will be some STEM, technologies, engineering,
engineering, arts, and mathematics, but really high interest for kids to engage and participate in and enjoy coming into the school in kind of a fun environment while learning and experiencing a, a summer camp type of experience. It also allows us to get some summer resources, um, text, and that kind of things in hands of students so that they can practice and remediate some of the skills that they had over this year, but also give them some, some lesson trajectories to help build some skills and enhance them before they come back into the school year for the fall. Go right ahead. All right. Good, uh, good evening, board members, Dr. Kane, executive team. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Page. I'm the supervisor of science, PE and health and environmental education. And uh, the portion of this grant that I wrote was in regards to expanding our schools uh, in terms of, you know, we have these brick and mortar schools that we can't really expand any of the space. So the idea was to create outdoor uh, educational classrooms. And this goes, uh, you know, we're gonna have these outdoor classrooms for the students, staff um, that they can utilize to do um, multiple multiple things. So um, a lot of our environmental education curriculum that we'll have there. So it'll be the pavilion with the with chairs, with seating, with um, all kinds of resources for our students in order to do things outside and uh, expand our schools to those to our uh, schoolyards. So we are really excited, really happy. <laughs> you know, we got <laughs> really, this, uh, happy. <laughs> really happy. Really happy. We got this. Uh, uh, you know, just just now, really. So. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Thank we really you both. Well done. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So that's that's part of our great news. And, and we just are so excited to be able to offer this for children and get some outdoors, learning outdoors and, uh, and engaged in STEAM activities. So we just are really, really excited about that. More to come on that. And also, uh, last but certainly not least, I'll go ahead and, and make my announcement that as I uh, depart transition from Queen Anne's County Public Schools, I have accepted a position for professor of practice at University of Pennsylvania. I will be working in the Ed Leadership Program. I am so very, very excited. Uh, University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education is the number one Ivy League university for graduate school education in the country, and they are excited to have me. I am so excited to be there and looking forward to doing all that I can to serve that learning community. So Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. And that does it for me. Okay. Excited. We have our student board members, Ms. Smith. Good evening. Good evening. Natalie Smith, student member of the board for Queen Anne's County High School. Um, in the month of March, we had, we were continuing to honor student of the, employee of the month. So far we have 796 students receiving a lot electronic positive referrals. And then on March 17th, the PTS, the PSAT was administered to approximately 103 students. And then on March 24th, the SAT was administered to approximately 122 students. Also, Andrew Williams, a junior, was named Performing Arts Teen of the Week for his outstanding con contributions to the Queen Anne's County High School Band Program. And upcoming in April, 117 students will take certification exams in effort to earn certifications for various CTE programs. Spring sports are beginning April 17th. Students will compete in baseball, bocce, boys and girls lacrosse, softball, boys and girls tennis, and track and field. On April 22nd, 865 students will begin the four day, full day adjusted hybrid schedule. And then we're super excited, June 2nd, <laughs> administration said we can graduate in the stadium. So, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Grace. Ms. Grace. We'll hope it's a sunny day. I hope so. If it rains, I'm going to We cry. got a day. We'll back it up. <laughs> when do you order your caps and gowns, or is that already started? I already ordered them. I think we picked them up at the beginning of May. I'm 
I'm excited for graduation as well. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a, a different year. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> So Alexis Gross, uh, Ken Island High School student member of the board. So in the past month of March, we've had quarter three interims be sent out on March 8th. Uh, we also had a very successful school SAT day for the juniors, and that was on March 24th. Fall sports have been in full effect, and there's been over 300 athletes playing, so that's very exciting. And then we had the Student of the Month Awards, and students were scheduling for the 21-22 school year and then while in April quarter three interim or quarter three report cards will be emailed home on Friday the 9th and then spring sports also begin at Ken Island on April 17th the four-day return to school option will begin on April 22nd and email surveys were sent home to families for they can give their choice for if they want their student to return and then the April student the month awards is on April 30th thank, thank you, you. Okay. okay since participation Mark you have your oh you know what mm -hmm. I don't think I do Here, you got it no oh. okay in places no, no, I'm good <laughs> for now. We ask all speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and their address. <clears throat> Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have a specific question, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and your right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens to show respect for all. Thank you. Yeah. Rich? Good evening, everybody. Oh, um, I need, need your name and address just oh, for the record. Uh, Richard McNeil, uh, 261 White Marsh Road, Centerville. I'm here representing the uh, Retired School Personnel Association uh, with a couple comments, um, enjoying this spring weather. Um, just to let everybody know on, on the board that uh, we thankful uh, had a March drive-through, uh, as I talked about back in the beginning of March, where uh, instead of having our general meeting and our luncheon, we had uh, a collection for the Family Center uh, up in Sellersville. Uh, it was a wonderful day. We had a good turnout. Uh, we had enough materials in terms of uh, craft supplies, uh, school books, pencils, all that kind of stuff that they use in that, in that center. Uh, uh, actually overflowed the back of an RV. Uh, and a lot of our members came through as they did before. Um, and we, we appreciate everybody who uh, supported that. So uh, again, thanks for letting us use the drive-through into the bus parking lot at the high school. Uh, we did that after everybody left. So we didn't get run over and they didn't get hurt. Um, we are in the process, just to keep you up to date, of our um, annual uh, scholarship fund uh, drive. Uh, we've already uh, been, since we're not meeting, it's, it makes it a little bit more of a challenge like everything, uh, but our members, again, are very supportive of that. I've been working with both high schools and their guidance counselor program so that we can advertise this as best possible uh, with all graduating seniors who are going to pursue a uh, avenue or career in uh, education. Um, again, we plan on giving at least two, one at each high school, we hope, uh, if we get that many applications and so forth. <coughs> And, um, and also with, with a, um, a third possible one for a book scholarship for a runner-up kind of a thing. So that's underway uh, for that. Um, I'm hoping to uh, get uh, and talk with HR about possible retirees for this year so we can make contact with them uh, before they all exit in, in June. Uh, we are very hopeful to, um, and we're in the preliminary plans of trying to find a location in July outside where we can actually gather together uh, and celebrate last year's retirees and this year's retirees uh, since we have not been able to meet 
uh, we're, we're looking at some a uh, couple of venues that we can uh, possibly uh, enjoy that way and get back together again. And last thing, I'd like to, again, uh, thank the board for their um, continued uh, support of our uh, health care package. Um, when I talk to, uh, I, I repeat this all the time, when I talk to early retirees, I say one of the biggest expenses you'll have will be your health care package and, and how important that is. And uh, um, so I'll just thank you for your continued support on that, okay? Thank, thank you very you. much for your time. <laughs> Here's your name and address for the record. Sure. My name's Bill Davis, 144 Wynot Road, and I live in Queenstown, Maryland. First, I have to give huge praise to the teachers at Centerville Middle School. As I have worked from home since the beginning of the pandemic, I get, I get to hear interactions with teachers and students I otherwise would not be privy to if kids were in the classroom. The teachers whom have taught my son and daughter have been absolutely phenomenal. One of my son's teachers, mom was dying and I overheard her say, guys, if I have to leave abruptly, it's because my mom is dying. If that's not commitment and dedication to your profession and students, I don't know what is. However, the divisive leadership in this county's Board of Education is something I cannot remain silent on anymore. Anyone who knows me knows this is way out of character for me, but enough is enough. Because we are a rural county, majority white, majority whom voted for Trump, with many wonderful multi-generational farming families, with many whom love to hunt fish and run a trot line, that does not make us a racist community. I sit at home listening to past board meetings, listen to the budget discussions, hear about declining enrollment and the associated reduction in funding. Yes, many students have moved to private schools due to the pandemic and lack of in-person schooling in the county public school system. However, you know what happens when the parents and students get there? They don't get this work nonsense, woke nonsense shoved down their throats. They don't get opinions and false narratives introduced at every opportunity. We toured a private school across the bridge and the first thing I asked the lady giving us the tour was, how do you handle social justice or political issues of the day? Her response was, you will never know if any of our teachers or leadership are Democrat or Republican. I wanted to sign the paperwork on the spot. I seriously doubt their parents get letters from leadership talking about the injustice and systematic racism against Michael Brown and Freddie Gray. These are opinions because someone does not like an outcome. There is no place in the public school system for these opinions, and in my opinion, false narratives. I seriously doubt their teachers are upset when a public board meeting, when in a public board meeting, leadership states that white female teachers are biased against black males in the way punishment is handed out. That is a rather broad brush to paint with. I have spoken to several white female teachers, whom by the way, I can only assume make up the vast majority of teachers in this county at the local YMCA, at, ath at athletic practices, and at the grocery store over the past several weeks, all from different schools throughout the county. And every one of them was extremely upset with this perceived mischaracterization. If this bias is prevalent in our county, the data should be made public and those involved should be removed immediately because myself and no one that I know of would to tolerate such racist actions. I read an article in the Baltimore Sun which referenced a county study from 1994 which identified the issue. I can only hope that is not what we are basing this on. We, we all know how this will end. A seven-figure settlement in the federal racial discrimination complaint will most likely be made, leaving this county and school system further divided. I thank you for your time, and I thank you for listening to an opposing view. Thank you. Thank you. Is that all, Carl, of her presentations? Absolutely. We, our first presentation this evening is with um, 
have Ms. Julie Forbes and Mr. Matt Evans, and they're gonna talk with us this evening about educational equity, the hot topic of the day. They've got some facts to share with everyone, and we felt that it was important because there's a lot of conversation, as Mr. Schifanelli alluded to earlier in the community, um, and, and lots of misinformation is out there. There have been, uh, I've gotten information back about some critical race theory and, and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of rhetoric out in the community, misinformation. All people need to do is simply talk to a teacher, an administrator, a child, and they probably would ask you what in the world that is. So thank you for being here, Ms. Forbes and Mr. Evans. Please talk to us about educational equity. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the board, executive committee. Um, we have some data to share regarding educational equity. Um, first, the purpose, we, we do want to communicate and provide data about our, our Queen Anne's County Public School students and provide more information about the proposed educational equity policy and regulation. Uh, as you know, the background in June 2019, the State Board of Ed granted permission to publish Comar 138.01.06, education Educational equity. Uh, these requirements state each school system shall develop an educational equity policy and regulation. And the proposed uh, equity policy and regulation was modeled directly after a sample policy that was provided to us by the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, MABE. Hi, good evening everyone. My name is Julie Forbes and I'm the Supervisor of Accountability Assessment and Data Management. And I'm gonna share some data with you tonight. Um, some of it may be familiar from prior presentations. A lot of this is actually available to the public right now. And at the very bottom of this slide, a really great resource um, just for members of the community and the public is the um, online Maryland report card, which can be found at, I'm gonna strain my eyes here, reportcard.msde.maryland.gov. And so there's a lot of great um, information on that site available to the public, not only for our school system, but for other school systems in Maryland. So the first slide I'm gonna share with you captures the enrollment that we had in 2019-20, um, just in terms of our different student groups. And I share the 2019-20 data with you um, because typically we report out for the most part about a year later after the data becomes public. So again, this came from that report card site. And so you can really see here a breakdown of our different student groups by race and ethnicity, by different student groups, and also by gender. Okay, and the next, oh, yep, yep, you yep. can go ahead, sure. Now the next slide would be something that you wouldn't necessarily find, but is something we're sharing with you, um, is if you look at our advanced course, pl advanced placement courses, and then compare that with our overall enrollment. And so typically students take advanced uh, placement courses, also known as AP, typically around grades 11 and 12. So those are the grades we pulled to make sure we had a pretty even comparison point. So what this slide shows you is the percentage of students that make up the entire enrollment in AP amongst those 11th and 12th graders compared to the overall enrollment in general of our 11th and 12th graders. And of course, um, as a goal, we want those to kind of mirror each other as much as possible. And so what you'll see here is, um, and I'll just kind of go through our different student groups. For example, our black and African American students make up 4.3% of the enrollment in those AP courses, while they comprise of 6.77% of the enrollment in 11th and 12th grade. Hispanic and Latino students make up 5.33% of the AP course enrollment and are 6.51% of the overall enrollment in grades 11 and 12. Students who are identified as two or more races, 4.3% versus 4.6. Our white students, 84.22% versus 80.56. Our students who qualify for free and reduced meals make up 9.43% and uh, currently are 16.32% of that population. And you can also see with our female students, um, they comprise 57.58% of the AP enrollment while they're about 49.39% of the student body in 11th and 12th. And our male students are about 42% um, versus about 50.61. So it just kind of gives you a comparison point um, to take a look at. So you may notice that some of the student groups may not be represented on this chart. And usually that's due to the size of the student group. So we have to keep that, um, we can't necessarily share that with the public for confidentiality purposes. 
I just ask well, just for of clarification. Course. Yeah. When we're higher than the enrollment, that means you're taking two classes. Is that what how that number gets above? Uh, we actually counted students only one time. So even if you took multiple courses, and that could be something you could look at for a different data point, could be students who are taking multiple classes, but how we looked at the data was if a student was taking at least one course, we only counted that student one time. So I, 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 I hate bar graphs, so explain to me. Sure. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Math was not my forte. <laughs> so you're telling me that the 6.7% of our African American total enrollment of 11th to 12th graders, 4.3% of that 6.7% are taking AP classes. Um, Am I correct in that? Um, close. Um, it was okay. a great clarifying question, so thank you for that. So the blue bars represent, of the, so if you were to take the total AP enrollment, so if we take all of the students in AP, 4.3% of those students are African American. Okay. If we take our 11th and 12th grade student body, 6.77% are African American. So it's not of the population, but it's of the total students enrolled in that. So you have you may have some 10th graders taking AP. Correct. And that would be in that 4.3%. We did not include 10th grade in okay. this because it's such a But then again, numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. so I'm back to it again. So if it's 6.7% of the 11th to 12th graders mm -hmm. are African American and 4.3 of them are taking AP. I, where am I missing this? Or are you saying that 64% of the African American students in 11th and 12th grade are taking an AP class? So Is that what you're saying? So I can share an example. So currently we have 78 African American students enrolled in 11th and 12th grade. Of those, 21 are taking AP courses. So the blue bar represents of the total AP enrollment. So if we just take, if we- In 11th and 12th grade. In 11th and 12th grade, right. And the reason we included in the 11th and 12th grade is that's where you see the majority of students in AP. Yes. And so if you start to bring in 10th grade or even 9th, um, we just wanted it to be a fair representation. We could always break that down as well. But this way you're comparing two consistent grade levels. So 11th and 12th versus 11th and 12th. But you know we could certainly go back and look at 9th and 10th and kind of tease that out as well. Mm -hmm. And and that's the great thing with data. We can always drill down further, look at it a different way. So but essentially it's about 28%, is that? 24.5%. 24 24 mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, of the students, correct. Mm -hmm. Right, of the African-American students. That's right. Oh, or not, you're right, 28%. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm trying to see if I could give you another example. So for example, if we were to look at the free and reduced meal, so students who qualify for free and reduced meals, so that 16.32%, there's about 188 students in 11th and 12th grade who qualify for free and reduced meals. And we have 46 students who are enrolled in AP. So you could say roughly, you know, a little less than about 25%. Go one bar graph over and explain the female, female to me. Yeah, absolutely. So what this tells us is that even though our male and female students you know, are, are pretty balanced in terms of 11th and 12th grade enrollment. Um, we have, when we pulled the data for this, we had 1,152 students enrolled in those grades that we were looking at. So this tells us um, that there's more female students enrolling in AP courses than our male students. And so they're actually making up, our female students are actually making up almost 58% of the enrollment. So our male students are making up about 42. Okay, Ms. Forbes, I'm sorry, because I thought I understood this until sure. we went into more detail about this. So where, let's go back to the free and reduced meals. Yep. Where, what is 9.43%, what does that even mean? Of the total enrollment. So if we look at every student who's taking at least one AP course, if we took them together as a whole, how many students, qualify for free and reduced meals of the total students enrolled who qualify. Okay. Okay. Okay, and so the next one captures honors course enrollment. Again, in a very similar way. So the orange bar captures each student group what percent of the enrollment they represent. The blue bar captures what percent of the honors enrollment the students represent. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble still. It's so misleading in the way it's laid out. I, I would rather hear the percentage of the number of our students that are taking AP. Well, 
I'm, I'm just not getting it. I'm sorry. For, so no, I'm not getting not the chart either. I thought I had it, and it's just yeah. No, no, it's me. okay. So, so the first chart that you looked at was the percentage of students taking AP. Okay. Right. And this the is second honors. one is honors okay. courses. Yeah. Well, I understand, you know, okay, I'm sorry, because I don't want to go past this without me understanding it. Sure. So let's go with black slash African-American. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have 6.77% saying that's a percent of total enrollment. They make up that percentage of our total enrollment of 11th and 12th grade. Is that correct? That's right. Well, in, in this, it's 9th to 12th. Not, for yeah. honors. Well, for honors, if you go back it to says, the It says I'm, I'm, I'm still oh, on sorry. AP. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, and so the 4.3 percent, it says that's a percent of AP enrollment. So I would, I was, I'm assuming that of the 7.6.77 percent that are African American, then 4.3. Is 64% of the 6.77, and that's what's enrolled in AP. But you're, I'm, I guess, I'm not understanding what the blue bar means if it doesn't mean the percentage is as it relates to the total population. So, typically, um, you know, and and next time I'm happy to share this in a different kind of format. Um, you know, whatever's pleasing to the board. So for this purpose, typically, when we look at enrollment. Um, what ideally we want to see is um, the enrollment of our group match the enrollment of the population. That's always the goal, and that's typically what we're striving for. And so in this case, what it does is it gives you a visual so that you can see um, if there are any gaps. So the two or more races are uh, actually almost equal, right? I mean... I mean, yeah, so you can because. see, yeah, so you can see where the gaps exist, exactly. So it just, it gives you kind of a nice visual, because again, the goal is we want to get those as close as possible. And when we set goals as a system, it's to kind of start closing those gaps a bit, right? Because if you're, um, again, you're, let's, let's talk about our students who receive free and reduced meals. So if they make up 16.32% of our 11th and 12th graders, if we were to completely chose the, uh, close that gap, we would have 16.32% of our AP enrollment also be our free and reduced, um, those who qualify for that. Right, but doesn't 9.43% mean 58% of the 16.3? I'm, I'm not understanding the, the two yeah, differences. Yeah, well, it's, it's two separate. It's two separate okay. things. Yeah, and and you know I'm happy again. Next time we could put it in a pie chart. Okay, so um, you know, so 16.32 percent of the amount of people in 11th and 12th grade mm -hmm. are on free and reduced meals. That's correct. Of that number, nine nine percent of them are taking AP classes. Nine point four three percent of all the students enrolled in AP also qualify for free and reduced meals. Okay, but they're a part of that 16 percent. They are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that. Okay. And there's no there's no discerning what race they are, they just are on free and reduced meals. Yeah, and we can look at that kind of data, and we did. Um, we cannot share it publicly no, because- that's okay. I, yeah. No, but that's all right, I, I mean- But we do look at it internally, like as a system when we're setting school goals and district goals, um, but it's just, we, we become limited in what we can share. That's okay, setting. But, but what we are doing, those people who qualify for free and reduced meals, those students are taking AP. It is available to them, and they are taking Absol it. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. And Got so, that one. and so the next one captures our honors courses. And so again, we're we're just when we look at you know setting goals as a system. Our goal, of course, is to again try to um, you know ha we our our goal is to capture the enrollment in courses um, to match kind of similar to the enrollment of the student group. So again, the orange bar represents if we were to take the total population in grades nine through 12, what percentage of that total of all of the ninth and 12th, ninth through 12th graders that that student group represents. So for example, of all of our students in grades nine through 12, about 5% identify as two or more races. 79.14% uh, of those students in grades nine through 12 identify as white. 18.71% are identified as free and reduced meals. 49.17% uh, are female, 50.83 are male. So then if we take that whole population of grade nine through 12, and then we drill down just to students enrolled in honors, and we take that as an overall population, 
of those students, we then can kind of go down those blue bars and say, okay, so 3.92% of the total number of students in grade nine through 12 who are taking at least one honors course are black or African-American. 6.13% are Hispanic or Latino. 4.42%, two or more races. 83.76, white. 11.61% qualified for free or reduced meals. And 57.62 are female. And 42.38 are male. So again, we see that similar gap, um, particularly in the gender, where we see more female students enrolled in honors than we do male. Okay, so this is our last year that we had available of the MCAP results. So that's the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program. As we know, due to the school closure this spring, in um, last spring we did not administer um, those assessments. So this is the last year of data that we have. This is directly from the Maryland Report Card website. And again, what it does is it shows you, this first set shows you all of our students. Now this is broken down exactly how MSDE shares the data and it's by the grade band. So in this case, the blue bar captures our elementary students. So when we look at the all column, this tells us that in 2018-19, when students took the English Language Arts MCAP, 55.5% of all of our students, when we looked at them combined, uh, were proficient in English Language Arts in elementary school. When we looked at our middle school students, 63.8% showed proficiency. And then when we look at that gray bar, it's 72.6%. So then we can move to our different student groups. And you may notice there's more student groups on this chart than the other. And that reason is because, because we're looking at the whole district population now, it's a larger population of students. So for privacy and confidentiality purposes, we can look at um, a bigger group of students. So we get a little more information. And every year when we do have this uh, state assessment result, you know, principals, their leadership teams um, dig into this quite a bit throughout the year and really drill down into it for their school by grade level, um, by classroom, and, and really look at it quite deeply. And so again, when we start to look at proficiency levels, we can see those proficiency levels in the different grade bands by different student groups. And I know we've spent so much time on MCAP, so I know this is probably um, quite familiar. Now, the one thing you'll notice that you're not seeing on this chart is the breakdown by female and male. And the reason for that is if you go to the report card website where they break it down by the levels, they don't break it down that way. So I actually went ahead and looked at it grade level by grade level, which you can do. Um, and I'd encourage you to go to that report card website and you will see similarly to the honors and AP, there are similar proficiency gaps between our male and female students and I know that um, in one of the later presentations, Mrs. Passon's gonna speak a little bit more about that, particularly around English language arts. So there's an anomaly with the English learners. Mm -hmm. You see 22.6 of the elementary kids are proficient in English language arts. Mm -hmm. And then by the time, I don't know if by the time they get to middle school or kids that enter in middle school, mm -hmm. maybe that's it. They're, they're down to 10.5 and then at high school, they're 8.3. Sometimes what happens um, is that students exit out of the English language status. And so they become more proficient as they move up the grade levels. And so sometimes by the time um, we have English learners in middle and high school, there's a chance that they're new to us. So they recently had that English, um, English learner status. Or sometimes we have students who you know, need more support to attain proficiency in the language and, and can become more in like a, a long-term English learner status. And so then more supports are provided to that student to help them achieve proficiency. But that, that's a great observation. And the other thing I see on Hispanic, they're the, that's the one group that goes up, but then in high school comes back down mm -hmm. where everybody else has made good strides from middle to high. Mm -hmm. any, and she just said that they may have already opted out. Or they may not have been with us. Or they may not have been beginning. with us the whole time. They've See, entered into the high yeah, school. Yeah, they some of the high school um, students okay, may have just got here. Okay. Right. And 
and so for this one as well, um, the high school bar captures the English 10 exam just for background. And this also is based on students when they take it the first time. Because sometimes students do have to take the high school assessments multiple times. And so this is the first time they took that 10th grade English exam um, for that gray bar. But it is interesting. Um, and, and I think overall, great to see that growth by high school. Um, in, in many of our groups, not all, but, but in many of our groups, you do see that growth by high school, which I think says a lot. So I know we're looking at the gaps <clears throat> between you know race and ethnicity, et cetera, mm -hmm. but if you look at all, so 55.5 were proficient, mm -hmm. then 44.5 were not proficient. Correct. Right? Okay. Yeah. And again, this kind of data is just helpful because it helps us set more targeted goals as a system. Because ultimately, we just kind of we want to keep working together um, to close these gaps and bring you know all of our all of our students. Of course, we want to increase proficiency, um, but also look at our student groups individually and see you know what what are their strategies we can use um, to continue that that work. Right, narrow the gaps. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the next one captures mathematics. So again, same same kind of context I provided earlier. It's reported on the report card website. It's by grade band. So you have your elementary, middle, and high. Um, and again, the male-female breakdown. Um, with the exception of a few grades, there were a few grades, um, probably a little bit more, where boys outperformed um, in mathematics. So it was slightly different in that way. The gaps weren't as profound that we saw between gender, um, which again, I know that would be a whole separate chart, but it is all available to the public. So just wanted to point that out. Well, now that I found this interesting that all of middle school across the board pretty much came down and then picked up again in high school. Is there something going on in middle school that do we know what happened the year before? Are we, are we um, tracking this? Because that's yeah, so significant. When, when we look at, it's interesting with um, math. So in middle school, we have students take sixth grade math, seventh grade math. And then in eighth grade, they're either taking algebra one, if they're in the algebra, if they're in the algebra one course, or they're taking math eight. So sometimes um, that, can, that can influence it, because typically your students taking algebra one in eighth grade tend to perform quite well on that exam, because they're already in algebra one by eighth grade. While you're, you sometimes see your eighth grade or struggle, and then your students who are taking um, algebra one in ninth grade, um, you know, they have that extra year. So, so that that does play a piece. Um, mm -hmm. And I think just in general, and Dr. Kane, I bet you could probably speak better to this. I think sometimes in middle school in general, we kind of see a bit um, of a slide, and then you know we work to bring kids back up because we know algebra one is such a key course for success in all of those following math courses for kids to be successful. So it, it, you know it's a trend across the country. Middle school is usually a year where the scores are not as high as in elementary school and high school. It's it could be developmental. However, in English language arts in Queen Anne's County, the last time we tested, we outperformed at the middle school level. Not at math, but at the middle school English language arts. So it's it's a it's not uncommon, unfortunately, but most of the kids who are high performers at the middle school level are at at least at eighth grade are in the algebra course. Is there a reason there's no high school percentage for the English learners in your math? Yes, um, that student group was too small to report publicly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so this next chart captures suspension rates. And so this is of the whole. So this is looking at last year for suspension. We wanted to have a complete year. Um, this is only looking at students one time. So even if a student was suspended more than once, we only we only counted them one time because sometimes students do have multiple suspensions. This captures whether the student was kept on an in-school suspension or out of school. So either or, if it happened, it's recorded here. So if we look at our to total student population, 2.14% um, of all students last year received at least one suspension. And so then if we look at the different student groups, what this tells us is of that student group, what percentage of students were suspended? 
and again, um, there's many, many ways that we internally look at this data and we get into it in, in a lot more detail because we can look at different student groups within student groups to really try to um, look at different ways and, you know, again, set goals, establish strategies um, around Forbes students can, and discipline. Um, Forbes, can I ask a question? Of course. So, uh, okay. 2.14%. Mm -hmm. Middle school, high school, Mr. Evans? The majority of that would be a middle and high school suspensions. The majority, but there are suspensions at times in elementary. So 2% out of 7,400 students. I mean, right. how does that compare to districts on the Eastern Shore? Uh, it's in, in fact, we've been one of the lowest in the state. I think Montgomery was is, has been uh, lower than us the past few years, but... Who? Uh, Montgomery County. It's as large as they are? Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And so again, when we kind of look at the data in this kind of way, um, you know, it helps us again establish those goals because again, we want to start to narrow those gaps. Um, and so we can see, again, different student groups and, and again, also look at different ways, different strategies that we can support all of our students. Um, and, and I think it's pretty profound. We do have a, that gap with more male students making up more of the suspensions, um, students with disabilities at 4.46%. Um, students who received th free and reduced meals made up, again, and this is of their entire student group. And it's just to create a comparison point so that you can look at a group as a whole. It just gives you a point to compare. Um, and if there's ever any other way you want this data presented to you, I'm always open to ideas and I'm an email away. So you know, don't hesitate um, if you have ways that you're like, hey, I think the public or I know that I can, you know, this is a more visually friendly way, you know, please feel free to share some thoughts. But for the sake of this, um, it's basically, again, just to create a comparison point. So if our overall suspension rate is 2.14%, as a system, maybe we want to set a goal that we would say we wanted to lower that. And then conversely, we would also want to look at all of our student groups and say, well, we also want to lower those um, rates as well. And maybe some of our student groups that have higher rates, we want to lower them a little bit more because, again, we're really trying to close those gaps. So it just gives us a comparison point when looking at our different student groups um, and how many of that group have, have received at least one suspension. And that was in the 2019-20 year. This, this dovetails on something that somebody brought up to my attention. The Maryland Public School arrest data in the last three years we have had no 10 or less and we're the only county county in the state so we're must be doing a good job with that by not having that happen in our schools because when i look at neighboring counties and counties all across the thing their numbers are well we're less than 10 mm -hmm. and 10 has to you know 10 or below you don't report so we have reported zero for the last three years mm -hmm. it, it's 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 part more meaning we don't have those problems yes. in our schools yes. that uh you know we don't have to have that action because no other county can come close to us i think somerset has two years but every other county has reported every year mm -hmm. So that's pretty, that's I, interesting. And I know that our principals have good relationships with our SOs, so that 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 uh, that partnership works well. Um, and it's the understanding on both parties, you know, we, we enforce the rules, but if there's a safety concern, that's when we mm -hmm. involve the SRO, so. I just, it does happen, it just, it's nice to know that it's not gone to that level. And it's been, you know, and I think intervention is a lot to do with, with all of this kind of information. Um, you know, it, it, you, ha you have a problem, it's, it's our, you, you understand it, but it's good to intervene earlier if we know how we can fix the problem before it happens. Absolutely, and I, I would say that's the goal of all school staff is to, when we, when we look at suspension data and all of those different pieces, is to think about, you know, what can we proactively do? Can we identify trends in the data? Like, it, are incidents happening at certain times of day, in certain locations, um, certain times of year? You can start to really look more closely and think about ways we can proactively work together to try to um, prevent the issues before they happen. And absolutely, anytime, um, if it's a data set like that and we can't share it, that's can be a good thing because the numbers I mean, are so the, low the, for the, the data. They share it through the, through the state. It's just if it's 10 or below, mm -hmm. it's, it's too yeah. small a number, so you don't want to share it, which I understand that point, but it just it, it, it struck me very happily that we, after mm -hmm. three years, we have none, zero, or not, we have less than 10, so we report zero, uh, and nobody, nobody else is like us in the whole state. Great. 
I think it's also important to, to, as we start to look at strategies, when we look at the highest bar, which nobody has mentioned yet, with our black African American students at 7%, considering the population size for the district, the question should be, why is this? And what strategies can we put in place to change this data? Are you gonna address those things in, later on or? We're just presenting data at this point. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay. Do you have any idea why that is? <laughs> Since uh, the superintendent raised the issue. Well, that really is, is the point of the, of the equity policy is to uh, make sure we are looking at this data internally, both in, and school-based. And then that's where the, discu the discussions start. Okay, so what what possibly is the antecedent? What is happening in this particular subgroup? You know, we try and look for, for themes and ultimately you want to come up with an action plan and see what is it maybe this group needs or, or is not getting that would help to prevent, because um, the whole point would be prevention to help prevent you know, the actual discipline infraction that would lead to a suspension. This is for, now this, these are the only two slides, this one and the next one that say 2019, 2020. Mm -hmm. So these are the current COVID year. Yes, yes. And so the suspension data really from that, we wanted to give recent data, but really, you know, once we hit that March date, um, and but for the chronic absenteeism, um, so the way we calculated chronic, so chronic absenteeism is considered a student, it's, it's a student is counted as being chronically absent if they miss 10% or more of the school year. Because of the unusual year last year, it was actually looked at as 10% of the total school days through March 13th, which was that final day. Um, when students um, were no longer in the building. So this, this next slide captures that the suspension one captured the entire year, but this captures because chronic absenteeism is calculated federally as 10%. So if a student misses 10% or more of the school year, they're considered chronically absent. Give me the dates again for that from 2019, sure. 2020. What, what yep. months are you, where are you? Yeah, so from? for 2019-20, so the suspension data captures all year, like the suspensions, that's how we were required to report from, to the state. Right, so what month and year to what month? And um, August, with the first day of school through um, the last day of school in June was for sus of 2020. suspension data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then chronic absenteeism, the way we were directed by the Maryland State Department of Ed to report chronic absenteeism last year was based on attendance through March 13th. And the reason why was that school systems were calculating attendance in different ways due to the circumstance. It's um, There's been uh, just a lot of guidance since then, so they just wanted to make sure that when they were looking at school systems, they were comparing that same set of time um, for chronic absenteeism so that they weren't counting 10% of the entire year, they wanted to look at it in terms of 10% of the days kids, uh, students were physically present until that closure. Normally, okay, so that's going from August until March 13th. That's correct. Okay. And normally it's, um, you know, first day of school through the last day of school, and if a student's been absent 10%, which would be 18 days, so 18 out of 180, then they're considered chronically absent. So, and that's irregardless of having documentation. That's correct, thank you. Because I've been that. on this list. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. my daughter had surgeries, we were we were notified, yep. but she was allowed to make up work, whereas mm -hmm. somebody who's undocumented should not be making up yeah, work. Yeah, this is any absence. So um, documented for an illness purpose or not. If now that seems like it could be a little misleading. Because uh, chronic absenteeism, you just kind of, I get a sense this, of. Yeah, this is the federal definition of it. Okay. Um, and we're required to report it as such. So yeah, and, and again, regardless of the circumstance. And Have we so, gone further and identified which ones were, what percentage were um, surgery or? or undocumented yeah. or undocumented. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we actually have, um, our, our schools do a great job of really working with their students and reaching out if they're noticing students with attendance challenges and they're very aware of who is out due to, you know, an illness or some, some unusual circumstance going on versus a student that, you know, maybe isn't mm -hmm. there for other reasons. Um, and, and we have some tools that we have within our student information system to track that data every day. So could I make a recommendation? Because again, bar graphs are not my forte. Mm -hmm. If we just said the number of suspensions this, this school year was, and I did the calculation, 158 suspensions. And of that 158, you know, 12 of them were, you know, Hispanic, 
10 were two or more. You know, that way we can see the actual numbers rather than spar graph because it, it's kind of been misleading to me that because this these numbers don't even equal up to 100% of the amount. So to me, I, that's why I think that's why I'm having help, trouble with it. And the reason um, we're often held accountable to of the whole is for accountability purposes. Okay. Because we are accountable um, to ensure we don't have disproportionality between student groups and, and school districts can be identified for that, you know, if there's okay. disproportionality. Okay. So oftentimes, sometimes, if we take of the whole, what you're not seeing um, is, but what percentage of the population is that student group? So is there disproportionality there? So typically it's of that student group, what is the percentage um, that falls in this category? So we can see, you know, if there's a student group who's much higher or much lower, it, it kind of teases it out a little bit um, for those accountability purposes to make sure that, because again, and then when we set those goals, it helps us really kind of narrow into, um, you know, a course for suspension, bringing those numbers down and for proficiency bringing those numbers up. Oh, thank you. Do we, yeah. keep, do we keep track of the reason for the suspension? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. We um, we look at, when we look at our suspension data, we, we look down to um, the, the, the discipline infraction code. Am I using the right. terminology that right. we track? Um, right. So we can actually look at it in a much more detailed way and, and our schools can do that as well. So again, when we're talking about, you know, proactively trying to strategize to support our different groups, um, when we see that kind of those disproportional amounts between two groups that helps us um, look a little bit closer internally. Could, could you prepare something yes. like that for us to mm -hmm. take a look at? So it, it depends on the size of the student group to share it publicly. Mm -hmm. um, Kind of like what you just said, you couldn't share a couple of them. Oh, in terms small, of, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could talk with Mr. Evans. Because, he usually reports that, I think, don't yeah. you? So we, I, I know it's more difficult out of power school, but each school has called a, a mm -hmm. Swiss, a school-wide information mm -hmm. system where it's very easy to get the, yeah. to, to filter it by the infractions. So yes, we could get that. Yeah. yeah, we could provide that. Yes, I'm sorry. I was thinking more student groups. I wasn't thinking the Sure. Group. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And what's uh, throwing a snowball? What is that? Because I got suspended for that. A long time ago, throwing a snowball oh. <laughs> in the parking lot. Well, did you hit the person? <laughs> it was too long ago. I reckon I did. Plead the fifth. There you go. Yeah, but we, we certainly can, and Mr. Evans, I'm mm -hmm. happy to support you with that. It was 1981, Miss Bass. <laughs> <laughs> she was there. Oh. <laughs> And again, just to jump to that last chart. So again, when we look at all students, 15.5% of our students last year were considered chronically absent, which meant they missed 10% or more of the school year. Um, of our African-American students, 21.44% were chronically absent, 17.36% of our Hispanic Latino students, 18.75% of our students who are two or more races, 14.65% of our white students, 17.34% of our English learners, 25.43% of our students who qualify for free or reduced meals um, were considered chronically absent, 21.71% of our students with disabilities. And then this is one of the charts where it's a little more closer between our female and male students. That females were a little bit higher at 15.92% and male students at 15.09. But again, you know, when we look at, um, we want to bring all of these down um, and, and, and the groups that are much higher, we want to bring them down even further. So when we set goals, you know, we want to set a goal for the whole student population, but our groups who are much higher, um, we want to set an even bigger goal because again, we want to start narrowing those gaps because we know how important it is for um, our students to be in our buildings. I think though that for me to get a better picture of, of what's excused and what's not as if since you're going to go ahead and put something together for types of um, uh, suspensions, if we could also get a breakdown of how many were, what percentage were excused and what were yeah. Not sure. excused. You mean absences? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. But just to be clear, for the federal mm -hmm. definition, it doesn't matter if it's right. excused or right. not. It's, a, right. it's an absence. Right. And, and what actually goes down on the student record card is days enrolled, days absent, days attended. So it doesn't designate. Well, but I think you keep track, don't you? Because don't you then send... Um, I get a report and it gives me all the codes mm -hmm. that have been entered for each of my children on days that they missed this class or a whole day or and then when I send the note in I'll see it on the next report that that code may have changed. 
because of when the report came out. And we and we do use those codes, and certainly at the elementary level, because if there's a, a student that's true and unlawfully, we, we have to address that. And that's it's why fine. really we do them by unlawful, lawful absence. And lawful absence certainly could be medical or, or other reasons. Mm -hmm. But okay. ultimately, what's what's on the permanent student record is days enrolled, days attended, days absent. Yeah, no, I, I totally understand that, yes. So what that would concern me greatly is absenteeism, once a child gets behind, and you know you're talking class of 18 to 25, and it's chronic, then they never get caught up. I mean, it's, you know, because a class is moving like this, and they're not up with it, up to par, I can just think it can snowball to the point mm -hmm. where there's where you have some real issues. So I think attendance is a probably a major issue through all our system, you know, and if even if it's unexcused or excused, a way to, if they're not there, to get them caught up quickly because, you know, in a lot of classes, if, if you if you missed the first quarter, you, you, you might be, you finished. Absolutely, and that's really why we use this, con this chronic absentee rate metric because even if it is excused and lawful, it's an issue when you're missing instruction. So, uh, and certainly our PPWs out of my office, uh, at every school they have a student support team that meets regularly, and that's one of the major issues that is looked at uh, data-wise is, you know, who are our students who are missing instruction, both lawfully and unlawfully, because even if they are out, you know, parents are writing notes or, or there are issues, we want to intervene in some way so that they're getting what they need. Because and in some to... cases, it might be put on home hospital instruction where we're sending someone to the house and they're actually counted as present then. It might be interesting to see how these numbers turn out with the adoption of the counter for next year, given they're getting more time around certain holidays, yep. if these numbers drop. It, it, it would certainly be very interesting to look at the days that we have the highest levels of absenteeism as well and look at mm -hmm. those trends. And then, like you said, have that comparison point for next year to see if it makes a difference. Because I think um, we, we all probably are in agreement that if we can impact chronic absenteeism, you're going to see positive effects across the board. Mm -hmm. Because if you have students come to class more, um, when they're able to, of course, um, then you're going to see that kind of positively impact in other areas to proficiency, um, you know, just to name one of them. So. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next will be the school resource unit is. Shut this one off. Good evening, Dr. King. How are you? Good, how are y'all doing? Good evening. Um, first, I wanted to say just thank you to the board and thank you to Dr. Kane. Um, we've had some challenging years as far as you know being able to get into the schools with certain programs, but we've had a great partnership in the past pre-COVID. Um, active assailant training that we've done in the schools, Stop the Bleed, and uh, Dr. Kane uh, got us into the schools with a lot of the age-appropriate um, based programs that we were able to teach all the way from kindergarten all the way through to our seniors. And I uh, really appreciate the partnership that our office shares with the board as well as Dr. Kane. It really it really means a lot, it goes a long way. Um, there's been a lot going on in Annapolis, I think we all know that, with the bills that have gone back and forth. Uh, we've been monitoring all the bills. Um, seems like several of them uh, have not made it very far, which is good, and obviously we're still watching you know, House Bill 522. To, to kind of see where that goes. But I um, just want to let you know that we do have our pulse on that, and uh, it does also preclude into the facts that uh, I really appreciate you supporting the school resource officers. Uh, I think they're vital to our community. I think they're vital to our schools. And 
And the school resource officer is uh, much more than just brick and mortar security. They're a friend, a coach, they're a partner, they're somebody who uh, helps that student get through something, and they're a familiar face and they're comforting um, in all the things that we see nowadays with uh, our news media and things like that. So I'd like to introduce to all of you uh, Lieutenant Mark Meal. He heads up the resource unit and we're gonna kind of go over the presentation with you. Slide number two. So believe it or not, this is the school resource office school resource officers in the unit. Um, quite a contingency of personnel, but we do have quite a network of schools within the county. Um, so Lieutenant Meal, First Sergeant John Myers, Jeremy Davidson, Sergeant Corporal Ryan Davidson, DFC Alex Cooper, who is our new DARE instructor, uh, DFC George Parker, DFC Patrick Madison, DFC Savannah Dickey Faggot, Faggart, DFC Joseph Patikowski, and DFC Austin Patchett is your school resource officer team. I didn't want to bring them all in because somebody would probably say we had too many people <laughs> in the room or we didn't have the masks on. So, But I want to introduce to you that staff because they do a great job. Um, it takes a very uh, dedicated person, a person who is uh, very familiar with working with youth to, to be in that position in the schools. And uh, it's a very trusted position. Uh, and, and we do um, see that in the work that they do. I'm going to let Lieutenant uh, Mark Meal talk to you about the purpose of the school resource officer in the unit. Good evening. I'm Lieutenant Mark Milk of the Sheriff's Department. I am the Support Services Division Commander. One of the units that I oversee is the Sheriff's Resource Unit, which is the school resource unit, the officers who are assigned to uh, the School for Security. Thank you, Dr. Kane, for allowing us to be here tonight, and the board as well. Thank you all very much. Uh, the, the Sheriff's Resource Unit is, is a multifaceted unit that works in partnership with the Board of Education, along with other partners uh, within the county. We are a goodwill uh, ambassador, if you will, unit, uh, a liaison for the community, Board of Education, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, as you can see from the list on this slide, uh, there are many duties, uh, all of it, not all encompassing, but it gives you a good idea of what they do every day. Um, yeah, we have MOUs with each entity. We have an MOU, mem uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the Board of Education that covers our operational capabilities within the schools. We're in constant communication with the board and staff at each school uh, on daily operations. Uh, we also have uh, MOUs with other entities, other departments, uh, law enforcement agencies as well uh, to help assist with school coverage throughout the county. Uh, we have uh, CPD, Centerville Police Department also assists. And I'll talk about that later on in reference to the DARE program. They're also on board with that as well. Um, our, our main objective in the schools is school safety, obviously. Uh, safety for the students, number one priority. Safety of the faculty and staff of each uh, facility and also uh, at the Board of Education. Any, any place the school uh, is responsible for, that's our main objective. Uh, we're there to promote uh, respect for everyone on, on premises and in the facility. We're there as a physical deterrent uh, from any nefarious activity that may, a person that may try to come in there and do harm. Uh, that's our main objectives. So the number one question is they see the school resource officer out there and they, they may see him interact with the students, but the real question is, is kind of what does the school resource officer do in and around the schools in the course of an eight hour or longer day? Um, they do do traffic control. They assist when they can with letting buses in and out and helping students get in and out of, get in and out of different schools. Um, their communication with the school administration, the parents, and also the students in the schools. They also patrol the exterior of the building. They walk around the campus of the schools. Um, they move uh, move around to look for things that might be suspicious, people loitering, different things that might be uh, things that we should be alerted to. But they also walk the interior of the schools. They make sure that the exterior doors are locked, uh, walk through the hallways via presence during the lunches and classes, and also they're friends to the students that are inside that facility as well as the staff and the parents and visitors. Um, they do actually have uh, the task also of the prevention of illicit substances uh, and partnerships with the Board of Education, checks of the vehicles, lockers, um, or other areas as directed by the school staff would be done by the school resource officer in the school. 
Now, as far as the uh, the operational uh, responsibilities of the resource unit deputies on location, obviously one of the uh, primary objectives too is to investigate crimes on, on school premises. We work jointly with the Board of Education and all the school staff uh, on investigations as, as best as possible. Um, our job is not disciplinary in nature of the students, that's the school's function. Our, our job is to enforce any criminal violations or civil infractions uh, that you know, are related to those types of uh, issues. Uh, another main objective of the resource unit is to limit interruptions within the school um, day. Uh, obviously, we need to have a cohesive uh, environment at the school for students to learn to the best of their ability. So we're there to assist in, in keeping a harmonious uh, school day uh, occurring every day. Uh, we are there also to assist with any type of emergency evaluation issue that may arise with a student um, or, or staff. If there's needs that we can assist with, we will. We have a great working relationship with the Board of Education that we appreciate. Uh, we're there to also to assist uh, with threat assessments if there are any involved, which leads me into the next slide for home visits. Uh, if you're not aware, um, the nationwide best practices for law enforcement these days, because of all the active assailant attacks we've had over the over the years and, uh, in various states, um, it, the Maryland Center for School Safety has adopted this best practice, which is called home visits. And what that is basically is if we get information, especially after hours, um, where we get information that cannot wait until the next morning, where we have to act on it immediately. And I'm talking in regards to safety of students, um, students at the school or the facility and, and staff itself in reference to anything related to weapons or any type of violence that we need to address immediately. We will investigate that. We'll have our, our SROs come out in the evening or on weekends if we have to, and they will conduct the investigation and perform home visits with the family and discuss that with the parents of the child and also locate the child to investigate further. And we will be in communication with the Board of Education staff as well on those types of uh, investigations. A lot of times I want to say on the home visits, they're able to um, de-escalate something. It may be just a conflict that occurred on a school bus or something that occurred on social media. And a lot of times the parents are unaware. Uh, the deputies actually go out and do the home visits, are able to mitigate that situation uh, to try to prevent that from coming into the school system the next day or, or on the bus the next day or, or getting it hopefully taken off social media or something like that. Um, you know, if it's something that's done with um, somebody who's bullying or picking on somebody or, or making a threat like that. So it's important that we uh, we still continue with the home visits. I can tell you that many, many times they'll send me an email or give me a call that they're en route to do a home visit at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. But it's important for the safety of the staff, students, and school uh, to make sure that we do those. So the big question is, is why do we do what we do? Um, one, for the safety of the staff, the safety of the kids, the safety of the visitors that go to the school reduce and eliminate all the threats that could bring harm to them and I create a safe environment to learn. I always say that uh, because someone knew and somebody out there sees something, uh, but they didn't say something, we want the community to understand that it's important to act now and let us know if you see something, communicate through the Board of Ed, communicate through the school resource officer, uh, through our tips line or something else. Um, our goal is to keep everyone within the school system safe. Um, that is the best thing that we can do, so. We have a new component to uh, our school resource officers and that's the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, the D.A.R.E. program is something that uh, is kind of an older idea, but it's been revamped and um, reevaluated to, to be much more of an educational and prevention program for students in regards to drug abuse resistance and education. It is a grant funded program through, well, it's part of the duties that I applied for a grant uh, through at the permission from the sheriff uh, for the Maryland Center for School Safety. They provide funds for salary for this position uh, through the grants. Uh, it pays approximately about 90% of the deputy salary and deputy DFC Alex Cooper is our current DARE, DARE officer. Uh, this program 
as I stated, is for education and prevention. It requires uh, our agency or any agency applying for this grant to have an MOU uh, with the Board of Education and also in conjunction with the local police departments because that money can be shared through the grant, can be shared with other departments to provide for this type of program and for school coverage in the county. And Centerville Police Department uh, joined in this program with us and the Board of Education. This, this program gives children the, uh, the tools necessary to learn about drugs, the dangers of drugs, the dangers of gangs, and violence. And as you can see, the curriculum goes from the elementary school level all the way up to the high school level. And um, we're in, injecting this in slowly since this is our first year with the program um, to get it into all the different school levels uh, as quickly as possible the next year or two. So, If I may interject, Sheriff, sure. this, uh, this program is an age-appropriate curriculum for each level of education, middle, middle school, elementary, and high school. Uh, so it's a very, very beneficial program, and we've already had talks with the Board of Education to get on the curriculum for this year in the elementary schools and then progress next year into the middle schools and, and so forth from there. So we appreciate the cooperation from the Board of Education. I think most of the parents out there or people that are watching probably remember the original D.A.R.E. program that we all went through and, <laughs> and how much of an impact that made. Obviously, a lot's changed since then and, and new teaching skills and, and new things have happened uh, that we need to bring forward. So this is a new, completely different D.A.R.E. program. Uh, it's been completely revamped, age appropriate, and uh, I'm really excited to see this. We've tried for many years to get funding for this. We were finally able to do it, and I'm really excited about getting this into the program for the upcoming school years. So, excellent. Thank Great. You. Well, thank you. I, I do want to say we certainly, uh, the leadership here, we certainly appreciate the responsiveness. I mean, sometimes, and yes, there are home visits that are late, 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 or early, 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 and you all are always right on time, right there to support schools, and we greatly appreciate it. We are grateful for our SRO. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank well, you. I personally want to thank you guys for what you do for the school and what you do for Queen Anne's County. Uh, we, we appreciate that, and I know the community does. A couple mm -hmm. questions. Sure. We just back in school now after a year being out. Have you worked with our staff to get an overall view and make sure we're right where we're supposed to be as far as security? And I know you can't say individual things, but just that we're up to date and maybe sure we're working hand in hand because, you know, we've been out for a year. Not that we've let our guard down, but things change and now we're back in school, we're, we're, we're full time. I just think. Yeah, as we normally would with any deficiencies, if we do see those, we'll address that with the school principal and then with the board as well. If we do see any deficiencies that we're out there. You feel so. comfortable where we are back in school and where we're. I think we're all getting, yeah. I think we're all getting back to to what a normal work environment or normal learning environment should be. So I think everything takes some tweaking. It takes some tweaking in my office to remind people to wear their mask when they're walking down the hallway. But yeah, I think that, I think we're gonna get there, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're having summer school this summer. I guess you're aware of that. We are. So you'll be yep. same. in and around the schools and providing the same level of protection I'll for this. Right. And any other board have any questions? Well, I just have a question about K-9 Officer Tiger. What is his main purpose um, with, as an SRO? <laughs> he is a warm, fluffy furball. <laughs> um, very kid-friendly. Um, he's, he's something that we can take to a community event and then something that we can also use to scan cars and eliminate narcotics out of our community and out of our school parks parking lots and things like that. So he's, if you meet him on the street, he's just the, the, the biggest, fluffiest, cuddle dog that he is, but when he knows, he knows when to get ready for work. So, okay. um, yeah, but he's, he's a great, a great tool to have in the resource unit. And the reason why we did put him in the resource unit was I would feel very comfortable with him coming in and out of our schools, uh, anything that we need him for, uh, parking lots, things like that. And could so. you probably say he's probably the favorite, um, officer? No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah, I, I would never, I'd have all the, all the canine handlers mad at me then. Yeah. So no, all the dogs play an important role in what yes. we do. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Chair Hoffman, just yes, thank you so much. Um, just give a little history. Some people may hear, may not realize, but back in years past when there wasn't enough money for school resource officers, you and your staff found it in your budget, made it happen. Mm. We've never been without your guidance all these years. And uh, just from the heart, I have to say thank you so much for the, from the community and the schools, everything. Um, yeah, despite yeah. what happens with this HB 522, we know that you've got Queen Anne's County 
We've got her back. Unless you guys make me, I, I, my goal is to always keep the school resource officers in the schools. Um, you know, um, we'll find a we'll find a way. But you know, my children have attended Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Uh, my daughter's going to attend the schools here in this county, and and I think it's a, a great safe place. And thanks to leadership and the board and everybody, it's you know, in, in partnerships with law enforcement, we've been able to do that. And the funding does come out of my existing budget, um, but we always find a way. I tell these guys. They know. Make sure that darn school's covered because it, better, you know, and, and it is. And I've got a great partnership with my staff on that as well because it's there are kids, there are teachers, you know, there are community members as well. So, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. We're, thank thank you. you. This board's elected by the people, and I think the, everybody wants to see you all where you are helping us out. And you're doing a great job. Thanks. And uh, no matter what happens in Annapolis, we plan to have you in our schools. We're uh, we're different in Annapolis. We are. And, well, I'm, I'm saying when I, I say huh? Annapolis, I'm using legislation. If yeah. Yeah. They come up with any different laws. Yeah. And uh, if you would, I'd love to see if you could put some time in in September maybe to come back and see us and update sure. us. I think it's good for the community uh, to see us working together, uh, the partnership we have, and uh, the public needs to know we're all in this together. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'd like to give you a shout out for um, my, my son is very fond of Officer Parker. He came out of Southernville Middle School. He's in the high school this year, so he hasn't had a chance to meet his new officer, but he's excited to. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I've had a chance to work with Lieutenant Meal and several other <coughs> sheriffs from in our vaccination clinics and our test sites. Your staff is wonderful to work with. Thank you. And just like every other agency in this county, pulling more load than just your regular job. I think right now it takes all of us to pull a bunch of strings to get it all done. Yeah. But that's what we're here for. So. Yeah. Thank you for your Thank time. We're sure, sure. missing Thank Officer you. Soul, too. We're missing him. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Shout out to him. <laughs> George, George Soul's the one guy that I've got uh, the picture almost with the arm around the kid walking down the hallway to high school. Mm -hmm. It's a very touching awesome. uh, yeah. touching thing to see, you know, the compassion that the men and women have that are in the schools. So. Mm -hmm. We're but, grateful for all of them. So thank you both. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Thank, thank you, Board. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank your staff when you get back there. I will. Thank Publicly, thank you. Thank you. Sheriff, sure. this is for um, Officer Tiger. Maybe he'll share. He will share. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is awesome. I'll make sure he gets this. <laughs> Okay, moving on, we're to the uh, 6-03, uh, Poverty Impact on Child's Brain. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. We have three of our fabulous leaders coming to talk with us today about trauma of poverty impact on child's brain. We have with us Mrs. Enzer, um, who is our Title I uh, liaison and jack of all trades and presenter for many. We have Mrs. Michelle McNeil, who does our Title I and migrant families and early learning programs. And of course, Mrs. Passon, who is in charge of all of our, um, starting at what, grade five or, or three. three, grade three and above. Uh, English language arts. So thank you ladies for being here. Thank you for having us. President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the board and the executive team. Happy spring. Uh, Dr. Kane just gave us such a wonderful introduction. Um, but again, so that the audience um, at home watching knows who's who. My name is Bridget Passon. I'm the English language arts supervisor for grades three through 12. And um, my name is Amanda Enzer. I am the Title I Family and Community Engagement Specialist. And I'm Michelle McNeil, Supervisor of Early Learning, Title I, Title III, and Migrant Education. So we're here to talk to you tonight about a particular group of students, and that's our students who live in poverty. Um, we're going to talk about the impacts that living in poverty can have on learning uh, because of the trauma that's caused. And we're also going to talk about the importance of equity in helping our students heal. Now, as you can tell, providing equitable resources is a team effort. So each of us are bringing things from our respective roles to this presentation tonight to share with you and deepen your understanding and our work towards equity with particular regard to students from poverty. Ms. Enzer is going to discuss poverty and pandemic poverty. 
Ms. McNeil will talk about the cognitive gaps, the ready to read act and the science of reading. And I will bookend our work tonight with a quick reference to uh, educational equity in Comar and then close this out by talking of the pow about the power of choice. Okay, so as we are all becoming quite familiar with, uh, educational equity means that every student has access to the opportunities, resources, and educational rigor they need throughout their educational career to maximize their academic success, their social and emotional well-being, and to view each student's individual characteristics as valuable. Now, those bolded words are my annotations. Those are the words that really stand out to me uh, in the work that I do for the ELA program in improving it. But I thought it was important to know that in Comar, they further drill down on the individual characteristics. And here's just a list of 11 characteristics that can make up one student. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about A and K. We're going to talk about student ability, and we're going to talk about student ability in relation to socioeconomic status, uh, with particular regard to students from poverty. Okay, so data story is always important. Uh, I know you just had a lot of data about two presentations ago, uh, and this color-coded chart uh, helps lay out the data trends for the last two years that we were tested in ELA and algebra. Uh, now, I know that this uh, writing is very tiny, so I'll kind of give some highlights um, for, for the audience. So with particular regard, so it has the state rank and then our rank on the Eastern Shore for the years 2017 and 2018 and 2018 and 2019. Overall, Queen Anne's County Public Schools comes in uh, the top third of the state, so there are 24 counties in the state uh, over these past two years that are on this slide. We have placed in the top third. And on the shore, uh, in 27 and 2018, we placed in the top three, and 2018 and 2019, we were one or two on the shore in all tested areas. So our data looks really great overall, whole picture. But we've been talking about achievement gaps, um, opportunity gaps a lot tonight. So we know that we're working on closing those gaps, narrowing those gaps for particular student groups, uh, namely our African-American students, our farm students, our special education, and our EL student groups. Let's drill down a little bit, and I'm actually gonna to go to my second slide. So let's drill down on ELA 8 data. So ELA 8, that's English Language Arts, eighth grade, scored the top in the state for two consecutive years. This is data from 2018, 2019 that you can find on Maryland Report Card. So 67.6% of our eighth graders in 18, 19 scored proficient. And that means they received a score of four or five. Five is the highest you could receive on PARC. It means you're exceeding expectations. Four means you're meeting expectations. The data included below is also disaggregated by gender. Um, so the two special services on here are farm students. Those are free and redu reduced meals. And that is how we, are identif how we identify our students in poverty and our special education students. And I also included male and female data. So overall male and female data, um, there is a gender gap there, which I'll address in my next presentation, but of about 24 percentage points. If you look at the farms data, um, males, 30% of our farms males scored at a four or five. It means they passed the state test. That means approximately 70% did not. Those 70% received a score of three, two, or one. So the score overall is on a, on a scale of five. For special education, uh, you can see the male and female further disaggregated data. 7% of our males in special ed received a four or a five, which means 93% did not score as proficient. So let me paint a picture with a scenario, if you will. Um, and let's, for argument's sake, take two boys. Um, let's take a boy from the farms category who scored a one, the lowest possible score. And he is in my classroom. Um, that farms boy who scored a one um, is reading two grade levels below. He is part of that data related to chronic absenteeism. And then let's take a special education male who's also in the same class. And let's give him a three. He is approaching proficiency. He is almost on grade level, meet, meeting standards on grade level. 
He is working really hard in an intervention that he takes. He is almost reading on grade level. He comes to school all the time and he works really hard. Now those two boys in addition to 23 or 24 other students are all in my class. But just think about those two boys. When I'm teaching a short story and we are analyzing a piece of text, do both of those boys need the same level of support from me in helping them meet the standard? And I just realized I asked that rhetorical and I didn't mean it to sound that way. But I think we all can agree that the answer is no. They need different things. I've got one student who has already missed, let's say 10, 12 days of school. And I have another student who just needs a little more of a push before he's proficient. So what do I do? And Dr. Kane, stop me if I get too far in the weeds, mm -hmm. if I'm giving out too much educational. I love language. the story. Uh, members of the board, please question anything I say. So, okay, so what do I do with these two boards? These two boys. So I may start with a whole group example for all 24 of them. And I may walk them through it and do what's called a think along so they can see how I approach the text, how I might write two or three sentences about it, how I might highlight or circle certain words. And then I might release them a little bit and let them work in pairs. And while they're walk working in pairs, I'm walking around to check how everybody's doing. But I've looked at my data and I know who needs what, and I'm really leaning into, literally and physically, pre-COVID of course, to check out their answers and to see how they're doing and to see, okay, well, what's next? Who's ready to work in a small group and who needs to come work with Ms. Passon? So in looking at that, it's called a lead. I know that this farm's boy, he needs to get pulled into a group of three or four students with me. He needs another example. Um, he needs the text chunked even more um, before I can release him to work on his own. But my special education student who, is, who has almost mastered the standard just needs an extra nudge, so to speak. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send him into a group with maybe one or two peers and all my teachers know when you send kids into group, everybody needs a role. Um, you know, what's their role in the group so that they're accountable? And I'm probably gonna make that special education male uh, my reporter. So when they're done with their group work and I'm done with my small group, when I get to his group, I'm gonna ask him to report what they did. And I'm gonna be able to formatively assess in what he speaks or if he shows his answer or his organizer where he is with that. And that will give me final data for the day to move forward with those boys. So that's equity. That's giving students what they need. That's looking at their data story and it's also thinking about them personally because before you know how to greet them, you also need to have relationships with them to see what's gonna work for them. So I hope in kind of grounding us in the language of Comar and a data story that that helps a little bit. Okay. So the essential question for us tonight is why should education care about poverty, right? What is poverty and why does it matter in schools? And so to begin, studies show that poverty is the single most significant issue impacting public education today. So besides the families that are living in poverty, education is the institution that is most distressed by poverty. Um, we know that poverty has changed significantly over the past 30 years. And recent neuroscience shows us that it is actually transforming the brain at the very genetic level. And so brain science becomes a big piece of this um, presentation tonight. But before we speak any further about poverty's impact, I uh, want to take a few minutes to, to define socioeconomic status and poverty. Socioeconomic status is generally referred to as the social standing or class of an individual or group. And it is often measured by a combination of education, income, and occupation. And that's sort of a general cons consensus of socioeconomic status. Poverty has many definitions, but when we look at poverty in education, we are looking at the definition of the extent to which an individual does without resources. It's not about a lack of intelligence, it's not about a lack of ability, but it's a lack of, about a lack of resources. It's about not knowing what the options and choices are. It's about not knowing the hidden rules of the middle class, which is what schools operate on. And when we talk about hidden, hidden rules, we're talking about those unspoken understandings that send a cue to a group of people that either they fit in or they don't fit in. And we are also talking about not knowing how to use resources to improve their lives. 
So this is ultimately where we see, see the greatest impact. We know that resources matter. We know that it's all about the early extras. When we talk about early extras, we think about babies, birth through five, being spoken to, read to, simply loved, touched, cared for, um, children who get enough sleep as one of those early extras. When we talk about late extras, we focus on those extracurricular things, learning to play an instrument, um, having the, the chance to play a travel sport, just all those, those extra things that many of our students do not get outside of their, their school hours. So before moving further, I want to look a little bit at poverty by the numbers. Um, studies show that a 60%, a there's a 60% increase in high poverty schools since the year 2000. In fact, according to a study done by um, the US Department of Education in 2017, one in four schools in this country have been classified as high poverty schools. So we, we know that this is an issue, but as I said, that is impacting education. As Ms. Passan mentioned previously, poverty is measured in public education by the number of students who receive free or reduced price lunches or meals. And in Queen Anne's County Public Schools, that's roughly 20% of our students who live within that poverty threshold. So approximately one in four students are considered to be farms. Um, I want to take a few minutes to tell you why farms data can be a bit misleading. And we really need to consider it this year as well. Our numbers are lower than what, what, they, what they say on paper because as we know during the pandemic time, all students have had access to free meals. So the current farms data is not an accurate picture of the vulnerable population of Queen Anne's County. In addition, if we're sort of considering that normal school year, um, farms numbers are also very misleading and, and not always ac um, accurate. And reasons for that being is that the farms forms are very complicated to complete. Um, there is, sometimes we face an issue, especially with our immigrant parents, there's a fear for filling out the forms. There's pride issues with filling out these forms that all contribute to the lower numbers. And then ultimately, some families have just enough income to surpass the poverty threshold. But when we look at the reality of it, they still can't afford to buy lunch. So all of those factors um, we need to consider when we're looking at farms numbers because it doesn't give the real picture of our students impacted by poverty. We know poverty is mostly rural, um, but not exclusively. And I, as mentioned before, I am the Title I Family Engagement Specialist, and so really I am tied to Title I schools, our four Title I schools. Most of my work is done at Graysonville Elementary, Churchill, Southersville Elementary, and Southersville Middle School. Those are our labeled Title I schools in Queen Anne's County. But I, I find it very important um, to remind all of us that there are pockets of poverty at all 14 schools across the district. And we've seen those pockets grow, especially during this pandemic time. So as mentioned, I want to specifically address the impact of pandemic poverty. And Columbia University researchers have tracked poverty rates in the United States just before and throughout the coronavirus pandemic. And the number of Americans living in poverty grew by 8 million since May of 2020. We know that the increases in poverty rates have been particularly acute for black and Hispanic people as well as children. And we have seen these numbers grow here in Queen Anne's County. I like to tell the stories. I spent a lot of time in the spring working on food distribution across the county, trying to find those pockets, those areas locating um, to provide food access to our families. And I had a teacher um, at Mattapique Elementary say to me, I've never seen so many people come pick up meals before. And it really reminded me, you know, I work mostly in the northern end of the county where our numbers were, were, were large, but there wasn't a significant increase. But when you started to look at those distribution numbers in the southern part of the county or on the island, people were really shocked by the number of families who were coming regularly to pick up food. So in our own community, we have seen a significant increase in, in food insecurity. Um, and as teachers, we know that it is very hard to teach or inspire by our children who are hungry. Uh, we have seen a huge increase, especially in the northern end with residential instability. Those who are facing poverty are twice as likely to have moved in the past year and three times as likely to rent. We're seeing a very transient, 
community, families jumping back and forth across county lines, school to school, anywhere where they can find a place they can afford. And then I want to talk just a minute about access. Um, and throughout the pandemic, and actually at all times, we've, we've discussed in great detail the inequities related to digital access, right? The Wi-Fi, the devices, those kinds of things. But I want to remind everyone that schools are essentially lifelines. And so this means that our families have continued to struggle with access to medical needs, good nutrition, and for our children of poverty, they've really struggled to have access to their support systems, because that's ultimately what, what schools are for many of these families. So I really wanted to just focus on give you a little bit extra detail on pandemic poverty. So now that we have um, talked about defining poverty and what that looks like by the numbers in our community, I want to talk about the impact and the major barriers on school success. Um, so we break these into four categories. But before we get into those four categories, we know that 40% of children in poverty are not prepared for primary school. We know that children in poverty are 1.3 times more likely to have a developmental or learning disability. And we know that by fourth grade, they're two years behind grade level. And by 12th grade, they are often four years behind. We also know that child development is nearly a two to one advantage of environment over genetics. So in a ge genetics account for 34% of influence and environment is 66%. In fact, a study done at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia showed that spending your first five years in poverty was more influential than gestational exposure to cocaine. So in other words, that means you are better off to be born addicted to crack than you are to spend your first five years in poverty. Poverty shrinks parts of the brain essential for memory, planning, and decision making. And we know that brain development is severely impacted without resources. And so this also connects us to the impact of chronic stress and emotional control. Chronic stress defined is as high sustained, um, high stress sustained over long periods of time. And then it's known to actually show physical changes in the brain surface. In fact, when they do research on the prefrontal cortex of children who have suffered from chronic stress, they are seeing that it resembles the brains of adults who have had strokes. So it's the same type of effects on the prefrontal cortex where all of your executive functioning takes place as those adults who have had strokes. Children generally become highly reactive, right? That real hypervigilant stage, that you know, that nervous stress, or underreactive, and they really start to show this learned helplessness. Um, and they show a lack of impulse control. And a lot of times, what we're seeing in schools are behaviors that mimic or symptoms that mimic ADHD, and it really is because of their environmental background. And then finally, we know that it has a great impact on language, nutrition, and cognitive gaps. Growing up in poverty impacts language, nutrition, and creates these gigantic cognitive gaps. Um, children start school with a lack of vocabulary. They have difficulty following instructions and expressing feelings. And they struggle with the foundations for school readiness. And ultimately, we know that that truly impacts the essential skill of learning to read. As Ms. Engler mentioned, the impact of poverty on learning, I'm going to specifically focus the on the impact of learning to read. As you can see, our many students, low-income families, are at higher risk of entering school with poor language skills. We're going to talk about three factors that um, relate to that. The first one is children of poverty are not exposed to language. They're not exposed to adult reactions, language and speech, and they're not having those interactions with other people. There's less exposure to the language, which can affect the development of oral language. And by the time the child enters the classroom, there's a significant difference in how the child is able to understand what is being taught to them and how to respond to others. 
The second factor is going to go a little bit as to what Ms. Enzer was saying, that poverty changes the way the brain develops. So you definitely see differences in the frontal lobe that can affect the cognitive and self-control. That's where paying attention, listening, and learning on demand. The difference in the occipital lobe, the back of the head, can affect the spatial skills for students. And then the working memory can impact the ability for them to listen and to remember what has been read and taught to them and organize those thoughts so they can walk away with an understanding. The last factor that we're going to focus on is the high levels of stress for children living in poverty. Our neural pathways responding to stress such as fear and anxiety may begin to overdevelop, leaving our other pathways such as reasoning, planning, and learning to develop more slowly. So how are we identifying our students that are having these reading difficulties when they start school? So the Ready to Read Act, which I've shared um, in the beginning of the year as well, um, started in 2021 school year, Senate Bill 734, which enabled all Maryland count school districts to provide a reading screening to all kindergarten students to help determine if they are at risk for reading difficulties. And based off of the data, those students identified at risk receive supplemental instruction to help support them in their reading difficulties. So let's take a look at that data. Our screening instrument we used this year was using the exact path. In September of 2020, our data showed that 44% of our kindergarten students were demonstrating reading difficulties, 35% were approaching on level, and 21% on level or above. The screening focused on letter identification, letter sounds, syllables, rhyming, and blending sounds. In March of 2021, we did a mid-year, and we'll do a post at the end of the year as well, but we had a decrease of um, students reading with reading difficulties. We were at 11%, 15% of approaching on level, and 73% on level or above. So what are we doing in Queen Anne's County to support those students with reading difficulties? Well, we continue to use small group instruction. Foundations is a tier one and tier two intervention that we use in whole group and small group and continue with explicit instruction. We incorporate our foundational standards in our lesson and we're becoming knowledgeable in the science of reading to understand the process of becoming a reader. And we have um, many professional development opportunities recommended by MSDE to enhance our knowledge on the systematic approach to support students. Those being the letters training and the um, REL professional learning community on emergent literacy modules. So what is science of reading? Well, science of reading really talks about how reading works in the brain, what to teach, how to teach, and structures to implement. This is um, something that MSDE has presented in order for us to understand how our students are learning to read, what stages they need to go through in order to fully comprehend and read the text. <clears throat> So here's a little diagram that we have. So if you take a look at the blue box, decoding and word recognition, this is the first stage that we need to look at. It's really the stage that's in red on the brain. It's your phonemic awareness and phonics. We're looking at word pronunciation, letter recognition, connection of phonemes to letters, and word recognition. Once we've achieved that goal, we move on to oral language comprehension, which is really your vocabulary, the background knowledge, and your listening comprehension. When you take those two together, that equals your reading comprehension. The ability for our students to understand meaning of text and to be able to read it with fluency. mentioned in the previous slide, professional development recommended by MSDE. There are two opportunities that we're taking um, advantage of and um, with our staff. One of them is a professional learning community suite on materials that work on four modules, print knowledge, phonological awareness, vocabulary, and oral language. The other one that is highly recommended by MSDE is letters training, which letters stands for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. And they also have an early childhood 
good training as well that we use with our pre-K-4 students. Currently, we have two teachers in our county that are trained in the early childhood training um, letters, and they plan to move on to the facilitator training so that they can facilitate and train all of our pre-K teachers in the county. We have three teachers that will be trained in the letters. Each of those trainings consist of 12 hours of training. So that's a lot about the learning to read grades, those pre-K to second graders um, who are learning to read and all that brain science that goes into decoding, understanding sounds, putting sentences together. How that plays out in the reading to learn grades, uh, grades three through 12, uh, is coming down to choice and offering more choice across content. In my content in particular, um, we are working to offer what's known as choice units. So in a choice unit, which we're trying to build at least one per year, um, students actually have a choice among two or more, more texts, and they get to pick the text that they want to read that will help them master the standard. And then the teacher uses shorter texts, poems, short stories, um, excerpts from other uh, novels or dialogue from other plays to help teach those skills. And then the kids take what they learn and they apply it to their own independent reading and talking about it in book clubs or literature circles. Uh, students in particular um, from poverty are oppressed and having choice is a powerful tool for them in their own learning. Being able to decide how they're going to learn is so critical. And some of the books we've already adopted, everyone on here except for Ghost, um, which will go out for um, information tonight, uh, has a character in it who is from poverty. And so we have already worked to include one book per, per grade level um, that where st our students who live in poverty can see someone um, who is like them, who is experiencing what they are experiencing. Conversely speaking, um, our students who are not from poverty also have an opportunity to learn. Um, yes, while it's fiction, they can still learn that while we go through different things and they look different, you know, we're all united in, in the human experience and feeling love and loss and betrayal. Um, so this is some of the work that we're doing in, in the reading to learn grades choice. So as um, I want to talk a little bit more about the power of choice in regards to those students who come from poverty. Um, students perceive classroom activities as more important when they are given choices. And so providing choice has many benefits. Ultimately, it increases intrinsic motivation, which is what sparks a student's energy and passion in the classroom. It increases student effort and it increases task performance because it finally creates personal relevance to the student learning. Overall, it empowers students to become lifelong learners instead of passive consumers of content because they have a choice in what they're learning. They're not just taking in what's being fed to them. Um, Additional benefits are it helps students practice decision making, self-regulation, time management, and organization, which are all identified as career readiness skills. So those are life skills we all use each and every day in the working world. I want to um, also point out that choice truly establishes something called the Goldilocks zone. And if you know the story of Goldilocks, right, the finding that just right bed to sleep on, um, sometimes it's referred to as the ideal challenge. But what we know about a child's brain, it is actively seeking the just right zone. So if we can find instruction and use choice, this promotes that just right approach for a child. That means it, it steers away from something that might be too simple and can create boredom, or on the other end, something that's too complicated and can really frustrate a student. So if we're promoting choice, we can establish that Goldilocks zone in our classroom to find that just right approach. My colleagues, Ms. Passan and Ms. McNeil, have addressed choice in ELA, so I just want to provide a couple additional examples across other contents. Um, again, I want to remind you that student perception changes immensely when they are given choice. So if we take a look at science, we're talking about providing choice in things like differentiating questions, explorations, and investigations, right? Or creating a variety of products for students to demonstrate their 
are learning. So I give you the hands-on example of eighth grade science, where students decide to use clay and toothpicks to construct three different molecules. And this is out of 30 possible options that they could possibly do to demonstrate how atoms are joined together. So they have a choice on how to demonstrate that learning. In math, we talk about self-differentiation, right, of a single mathematical task by making choices regarding the task content, solution processes, and working conditions. So if we take a look at a 12th grade class, a calculus class, and please don't ask me a lot of questions about calculus, <laughs> math's not my forte, but students, will, can, if they have the opportunity, can choose which differential equation to solve that is at that just right difficulty. So it's showing their understanding of the skill, but they're working on a problem that it meets that Goldilocks zone. In social studies, um, any kind of choice board, right? Your choose your own assessment projects because this is creating a learning experience that reaches all learners. So finding a current event that interests you, reading several articles on the topic and then recording a broadcast using Screencastify or WeVideo where you can summarize the articles and infer what the outcome of the event will be. Again, choice. And then finally, when we look at extracurriculars, students truly need opportunities to develop develop competencies, right? This is the strengths-based approach. So they need to be able to find other areas besides reading and math where they are strong and then choose to participate in those areas. You know, they, so they can excel in art, they can excel in theater, engineering, whatever it may be. And so they need to be exposed and supported to participate in these activities where they feel confident. The school setting is what provides the opportunities for these extras. Again, going back to our definition of poverty, it's access to those resources, it's access to those extras, and we wanna make sure we have those extras at our schools in both early and later on in child development. So we have to introduce opportunities for students to learn, to make good instructional choices, and this is what will motivate them and it will help them become increasingly self-regulated and in total control of their own learning. Okay, so I didn't understand either of Amanda's science or math examples, but I did understand social studies and extracurricular, and I certainly support um, that choice uh, is taught simply not given, and it gives our students a chance to cho choose the content, to even choose the process or the product in their learning. Uh, and as we know, you know, rising waters lift all ships. Choice is not solely for the student from poverty. It is for all students um, and engages them more in their own learning and their own learning process and in turn, hopefully, uh, their own achievement, their own success. So we hope that what we've shared tonight um, has helped deepen uh, the understanding of how equity can be used to serve a particular population, especially um, our students in poverty tonight. Um, do you have any questions for any or all of us? Any board members? I had a question. Just I it just piqued my interest when you were talking about factor one. Uh, children of poverty are not exposed to language. Um, can you expound on that? What is and how did they uh, decide that that was a factor? So students in poverty, um, you know, they're not exposed to the adults having interactions, hearing language being spoken. Um, so they don't get to hear and see um, the language because they're not being exposed. The children are either, you know, with someone else or they're just... You um, mean they're with somebody else? The well, they could, I mean, they or... could be with, they could, um, you know, be with other family members because the child's working or with a brother or sister watching them, um, you know, and they're just not having that chance to hear someone speaking or being able to speak to themselves and be interact into conversation because children learn by hearing others speaking. I'm going to add to that too so I'm not sure um, there's something called the 30 million word gap and that is generally the number of words behind that children by age three who are born into poverty have compared to those children's in higher income um, families and that has to do with if we look at parental language under stress which we know our families in poverty are are focused on survival and so the number of words used under stress are far less and I think about myself as a parent right it's no not now, go away, short phrases, those 
words that, you know, they're, they're not expanding vocabulary. So the 30 million word gap is just amazes me. If you look at number of words per hour, um, the difference of a family in poverty versus a wealthy income family, it's 600 words per hour in poverty, and then over 2,000 words per hour for a child in a wealthy family. So it's just, when we're talking about factor one in oral language, we're just talking about that, that, that language that children are exposed to from the time they, you know, from birth. And really, the more research done, talking to infants, even though they can't talk back, um, is so critical. And it's that opportunity for serve and return, for that communication exchange. And all of that ends up impacting their language development when they reach school age. Yeah. So, Ms. Passon, um, your first example, you have two students, mm -hmm. and one's reading at a level one, and the other is mm -hmm. just about to break into level four, I guess, right? right? He's yes, at sir. a three. Yep. And, um, and I guess your example is trying to um, sort of describe what equity is, is about, right? Yes. So you had two students, one needed more focus from you, mm -hmm. not focus, but attention. Yes. As the teacher. Yes. You noticed that, and then you took that student and provided that you know time. Yes. The other uh, boy or girl was with a group of two or three, mm -hmm. you know, a group learning, small group. Yes. Um, so I understand that if there's a child in need, you give him more attention. Is that what we're talking about as equity if or more resources? In this case, your time. My time, and I notice I'm, I'm also pulling additional kids. So I'm pulling anywhere from four to five kids. Mm -hmm. So that student with the one needs more of my small group time than the student who is almost on grade level who can benefit from collaborative conversation with his peers. Okay. I'm still checking on him. I'm still checking on him in the middle of class and saying, what does your group come up with? And listening, and if he's moving forward, that tells me he's good to go for the final assessment. And if he can't articulate it or doesn't have in writing, that tells me I'm gonna rotate out a small group, send my first group to go try an example on their own and bring him and maybe I'll move around the room and see if there's two or three other students who need to rotate into some time with me. Teachers usually do that routinely anyway, right? I mean, They do that in elementary. In elementary, it is more of a routine. In secondary, we don't have much as much time with them in the ELA framework. So where we may be doing groups, <clears throat> doing small groups two or three times a week, we know that that is going to increase to, to a daily expectation in our in our secondary groups, and we need to start getting, getting ready for that. Okay, because I've heard equity described as, by teachers and principals, it's common sense. Is that? it is. Okay. I mean, we've been doing, I've been doing equitable instruction before I knew what equity was, just because I used my qualitative, my relationship with the student, and sure. quantitative data to, to meet their needs. And I can give you a thousand examples from my 17 years in the classroom of, of how I was doing it before we labeled it as equity. Uh, so, so for us, it's very, it's very intuitive because we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, it's, you know, th there's a lot that's changed. Education changed. Education changed when the internet <laughs> you know, came into inception where you could look any answer up, we had to really figure out how to engage our kids, how to challenge their thinking, how to have, how to have them come up with an answer on their own. That changed, the, that changed the game, so to speak. Sure. And those children that don't progress enough, uh, do they get attention with reading intervention? Is that sort and of reading intervention? Yep, that's a so fact. Because I've seen them during our visits in the school, in the hallways, and, and wherever they can find a spot. Yes. They're working yes. one and, and two on one. Okay. And it's really, you know, as, as we get into budget season and funding, it's really where having a special educator, right? you know, a certified special educator who is in a classroom with 25 students, with five or more who have IEPs, that special educator is so essential in helping with that because then we can run parallel teaching stations, or we can run parallel teaching, we can run stations, we can really get into to the art and practice of, of small group instruction. All right. But then you lose me okay. at the rest, the connection between equity and the rest of the your presentation, the three of you. You know, I'm not sure where the 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 connection is, um, because you said that, like for example, the the I guess these are secondary novels, born a crime, educated, yes. which I've heard is very good. It is. Um, Pride and, and Refugee and, mm -hmm. and some of these others. So are these books, these were already proved, right? All the best. So are these books specifically for 
the kids in the lower economic strata? No, nope, nope. They were they're select. They have characters who are from a lower socioeconomic status. So. Oh, did you? I should say, so part of equity is being able to see yourself, right? Those providing windows and, and doors to students, opening up those opportunities, right? So these are novels um, from my perspective of working in a Title I community where students have the opportunity to see themselves in a book. Mm -hmm. And that is huge. When we look at families who come from poverty, students who come from poverty, their vision of the world is about three miles outside. It's, that's, that's the world they know. It's a three mile radius. Um, and so if we can provide them the tools like novels where there is a protagonist where they can really identify with that character, see themselves and then say, oh, you know, there's hope. Look at all the things that this child did. Look at the experiences they've had. And so when we're talking about the rest of the presentation and equity, we're talking about that this is another major factor and one that really impacts Queen Anne's County Public Schools because our vulnerable population is truly our students of poverty. Our farm students are one and that's that's an identifying characteristic. It's in the it's in those Comar characteristics which Ms. Passan addressed. So that's where the connection is. It's just looking at again these other equitable opportunities for students who come from from poverty. Okay. Protagonists they can identify with more easily. Correct. And just to and, and just to see see the world, right? See other opportunities, to be able to see things and understand outside of what they just know in their one stoplight town of Southersville or wherever it might be, this is the way they learn, they create, this is how we create hope, this is how they learn that there's more outside of their reality. Thank you, Amanda. So can, I, can I address that? <laughs> when, you talk Sorry, about, when you talk about the Goldilocks zone, to me it kind of sounds like you're staying in a safe zone. And don't you see that when students are encouraged to do more, they get more benefits out of it. They get, they become empowered, they feel a sense of accomplishment, they've gone beyond, because when you make something uncomfortable, then change happens. So do you see that as well, rather than staying within the Goldilocks zone? I don't think you stay in the Goldilocks zone. Okay. I, I think, I think, yeah, no, I'll talk for you. <laughs> okay. So, the, so, so you start there to build that confidence, to build that skill set, to encourage, look, if you pick this and this is your interest, watch what you can do with it. And then you set them up. That's part of the relationship. Okay. And that so it's not like they stay zones, there. Yeah, the goalie lock zone, that's where choice starts, right? This is where I'm comfortable as a student. This is where my brain feels successful. This is where I can be actively involved in my learning, all that. And once they're there, then that willingness to be like, okay, now I'm willing to try this or challenge this, that, that all builds from helping them discover that just right, that Goldilocks zone on their own initially. Okay. But it's not a safe place to stay. There's no. always gotta be the encouragement. There's always gotta be. Well, it's, you know, it's creating that hope. It's creating those opportunities, showing them that these are all the things they can do, pushing them to take those AP and honors classes, whatever it might be that we wanna show them. You've got all this at your hands. It's just making those choices to, to do that. Well, but it's, it's knowledge and power. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's, an, it's encouraging. It's it's growing, it's, you know, access mm -hmm. on, on a lot of different levels. Right, so I always say equity uh, is grant me access, give me choice, right? That's what. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Our next presentation will be extended works, adoptions, and striving readers. Get a double dose of can our student board members go? Alexis. Excuse me. They look like they're 80. letting me take another spot on your agenda this evening. I know it's a hectic agenda. Um, I'm here to report out on the extended work adoptions that we've been doing via, via the Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. Um, again, for the record, my name is Bridget Passan. I'm the ELA supervisor for grades three through 12. That's um, intermediate through high. 
So this is the third round, and uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Morissette and Ms. Harper, I probably should have brought you a lot of this information when we started our work together, when we started with round one and then with round two, um, but as I prepare for a monitoring visit by the state to see how we've been spending this dollars, all this information has been coming together, so I thought I'd be sure that our board saw it first. So my purpose tonight um, is to provide you an overview of the books that have been adopted, um, the potential adoptions. We're bringing you six books tonight. Uh, they're being paid for by striving readers, uh, and the work is uh, this work is rooted in in Comar's definition of educational equity. Uh, so moving right along. Okay, so Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant was a competitive grant. That means you had to apply for it. So each uh, county across the state was uh, encouraged to apply for it. Uh, we did in the spring of 2018, and we were awarded a million dollars over the course of three years. We got the year one money that had to be spent down pretty quickly. We had to spend that down by October of 2018. That was $400,000. Um, year two, we got another 300,000. Year three, which was last school year, we got the final 300,000, uh, but due to COVID-19, they have extended that um, till September of this year. So we have to account for it by the end of June, but we have until the end of September to pay for it. When we wrote the grant, we had to write to four goals, um, and the four goals are on the screen. We wrote to two in particular, um, strategic professional learning, um, which is various conferences that we've attended, uh, and professional development that we've provided for um, birth to five, and we also uh, wrote to tiered instruction and intervention. So tiered instruction, tier one is your general classes, your core classes. Tier two uh, is interventions, uh, typically in small groups, and those are math or reading, tier three is one-to-one -one interventions. So, uh, and I will report out to you or can report out to you later on you know, where a lot of the other money went, um, but I will briefly say that the bulk of our money initially went to overhauling our tier two intervention system. Um, when we looked at it, we were offering 27 different interventions across 14 schools, um, and students weren't exiting reading interventions. Um, so in doing this work in writing for the grant, um, we ultimately decided on a research-based um, ESSA-approved intervention, which is READ 180 and System 44. Um, and we are seeing, even despite the pandemic, we, we had a meeting in, in the beginning of March, and HMH, the company who owns those programs, is always so impressed with our work um, because our students are making gains, um, even despite pandemic learning or distance learning. And so I have some data to, to that end that I'm welcome to come back at another time and share out. Um, but by going down to just two tier two interventions, we've seen we've seen great success and we were making great progress. Uh, and then and then COVID struck and, and has slightly uh, readjusted things, but we're, we're still moving moving along. And I'm thrilled to hear that you've been seeing them. Have you been to elementary and middle? Just Not elementary middle, so yes. far. Just elementary. Well, yes. Do you have a favorite grade? Well, I have to say I'm partial to the pre-K. <laughs> The little threes, they're, the littles were adorable. Their backpacks are bigger than they are, and there's stuff in them. That's what I love. How about you? Do you have a favorite grade? They're all funny to me. <laughs> yes. so. Okay. Okay. So along with Comar, um, in summer of 2019, the state released a guide for us to use. Um, so a guide to educational equity in education, and I've linked it into the, to the presentation if you have it up electronically. So in writing our goals and working towards um, how we were going to spend the money um, because we had to spend it in uh, birth to five, uh, K to five, uh, and six to 12. Um, I, I pulled some of the major things that we looked at in this guide, which gives support to what the LSS should do, the local school system to, should do, and to what schools should be doing to ensure equity. Um, again, the bold print is my annotation done. These are the words that really stood out to me. Um, we had to look at our resources and use disaggregated student data to analyze and identify gaps and, equitable, and determine equitable solutions. And I hope that uh, this book choice helped do that or is helping to do that. Um, we had to look, and the federal government requires that we look at student groups by race and ethnicity and gender, which I'll get to momentarily. And we had to assess the implementation of vetted standards aligned curriculum for any bias or inadequate examination of perspectives. Uh, we have not been vetted yet. We are on the schedule, we are on MSDE schedule to be vetted in the 23-24 school year. That means they are going to come and look at our curriculum in ELA for K through 10th grade. Um, and I believe math's grades are the same. 
um, and in looking at, at the perspectives that we had coming out, the character, the author perspectives, we had some work to do um, in providing more equitable solutions there. But let me pause um, and address the gender gap. Um, and Mr. Chivinelli, our first conversation was briefly about boys and girls. I don't know if you remember that, and that's such, it is an important question. Um, across the country, across the state, girls do do better in ELA. Always. That is no excuse. That is absolutely no excuse. Um, but I've seen it come up in some of the comments related to the equity policy as well. So I thought I'd take this time simply to, to offer an answer or the start of an answer. So as Ms. Enzer was talking earlier, brain science, a lot comes back to brain science um, and the difference between girls' and boys' brains because we know that they're different. Um, whether you're in education or not, maybe you're raising children, you have a boy and a girl, you know that their learning happens differently. Thank you, sir. Um, so this is all a lot of science on here, but again, I annotated some important things that stood out to me. So for girls, um, they have a connecting bundle of tissues between the two hemispheres, the left and the right, the left that, that guides logic and the right that, that guides creativity. And they can crosstalk more. Because that bundle is bigger, they can crosstalk, they can multitask between the hemispheres. They also have neural connectors. Now, all I know that that means is that they can hold on to um, their, their memory storage, their listening skills are stronger. This helps with writing and writing in detail for our girls. And uh, the other, the hippocampus, another memory storage area, uh, helps girls, especially in the language arts area. Uh, Moreover, and, and we, we know this, uh, we, you know, women can be more emotional in their speaking. Um, and so that plays out as well in, in parsing through and analyzing important text. Now, boys, on the other hand, boys are better at spatial mechanical functioning. Um, that means, you know, kinesthetic learning, using things, moving things. Um, knowing how things work, wanting to know how things work, putting things back together. Their skills are stronger there because their cortical areas um, are dedicated to that kind of functioning. Um, the second bullet uh, towards the bottom, you know, I think this is interesting and, and it even makes me think of, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, that boys tend to zone out when you use too many words. Um, you know, if you've been in a marriage or, or, you know, you know that too. I know when I'm using too many words on my either stepson or my husband, they, it, it glazes over. So, and, and that happens in the classroom as well. So our boys respond more to symbols, uh, pictures, diagrams. They like to see things. Um, our boys do, and we know this, they generally do better in math and physics. Um, and we see all these programs out there for girls to increase girls' um, knowledge, skill set in STEM um, or in STEAM. Um, I have yet to see uh, any kind of program that really forces boys to enjoy, lit enjoy literature more. I, I would love to see the same energy that's going to STEAM and, and girls and how they're working in computer science, math, physics. I would love to see that same energy. But it's not there yet, but we can do a few things. So in moving on, um, how can having a choice among books you know, help close this gender gap? So I pulled some data from another source, and I've linked all the sources in here so that you can, uh, so that you can reference uh, uh, this. Um, boys tend to resist stories about girls. Okay, They don't want a girl main character, um, whereas girls don't. So three of the books I'm bringing you tonight have uh, males as main characters. One of the books, Harbor Me, it has um, a female as a main character, but there's, there's six other seventh graders in the story, and they each get to tell their own personal story. So I kind of want to count that one as having boys as well, because there's only two girls in that book and four boys. Um, boys like to read about hobbies, sports, and things they might do or be interested in doing. So two of the books um, we have tonight uh, are linked to basketball, the book The Crossover and Rebound. Uh, basketball is about the only sport I understand, but I had to look up what a crossover was. Um, and I watched it a lot in the final four and, and pinpointed it, so I'm, I'm excited about that. There's another book, Ghost, that has to do with track, with running. Uh, boys like to collect things and tend to like to collect a series of books. Um, if you have boys who have read Harry Potter or, or the Percy Jackson series, is very popular among boys, um, they come in a series. Um, Ghost is a book that comes in a series. It's a series of four. We're only working to adopt or hoping to adopt the first one in the series. 
Um, and boys tend to enjoy escapism or humor, um, and some boys are passionate about science fiction or fantasy. So for science fiction and fantasy, we have Ender's Game already in grade seven, um, and in grade eight, Ender's Game, pardon me for looking. books, Andrew's Game and a look later. Andrew's Game in seventh grade and the dark is rising which is by um, Susan Collins. Um, Will is that main character. That is in grade eight. Um, boys tend to enjoy escapism and humor. Um, I did not get to be a mom, but I do have two stepsons that I lived with when they were in middle school. Um, and I have to say that I giggled at a lot of things in the books with male characters because I can hear it being something that in particular one of my stepsons would say. Um, so it's timely, it's relevant. Um, and so we're hoping that in these adoptions we have met some of these needs. We can't do this all by ourselves. So the research also shows that you know if parents can help us close this gender gap, there's lots of different things that parents can be doing um, at home. Modeling reading, having a designated reading time. Maybe you sit down for 15 to 20 minutes an evening and everybody reads either the same thing and you can have a family book study or book club or you all read something that you want to read, preferably not on your phone. Um, you know, actual text, although your phone is fine, we'll, we'll, we'll fight our battles accordingly. Um, parents and sons reading together and taking time to navigate difficult materials, um, looking up information together to solve things, um, understand how things are built, how things can be fixed, um, using that time when you're in the car, um, to read um, and keeping a reading log to show boys the progress that they're making in, in their own reading. Um, so there is work we can do uh, together to, to help our boys. In deciding on books and books to choose, um, our high school books have already been adopted, but I'll share out what we've done there. So this data slide has our enrollment from the 1920 school year, um, broken out in gender um, and then by, by race. Um, so you can see that we're almost at an even split between male and female, but in regards to race, 79% um, um, are white, which we know that. Uh, the next highest um, race is Hispanic at 8%, um, followed by black at 6%. So prior to the adoption, um, we had 27 works in, in our high school courses across eight courses. So that's on level and honors. And you can see on this chart that prior to the new adoptions, most of the protagonists, so the protagonists are the good guys, most of the protagonists were white and most of the protagonists were male. Now as we're getting ready to be vetted, one of the things on which um, we'll be gauged is our variety of text. So this clearly shows that we had some work to do in offering a variety of texts from different cultures, different ethnicities, different races, different backgrounds. And if I might just pause to say, you know, while they are all different, there are differences in the books that, that we've adopted among the characters. What I love, and I could go on and on and on about literature, is that despite the differences, we, we are united. We are united by the universality of the human experience that literature can offer. And so it's so important to offer students at least one character across their secondary career that looks like them. And it's important to offer students the choice to read something with a main character who doesn't look like them or hasn't had the experiences that they've had in life. So the great news is these were all the adoptions um, and Ms. Morissette and Ms. Harper and Mr. Smith have been part of this first two rounds of adoptions that we've been able to do. And you can see um, we have uh, lots of different books with males, with females, um, Hispanic, white. Um, we, uh, we even had our, have our first white um, non-binary character adopted into English 4. Um, that's our senior English class. So a lot of great progress. The green here, and Ms. Harper asked me questions as you need to because I don't like charts either, but color coding can help. So I'm hoping if I can read this, everybody should be okay because I do not enjoy overwhelming graphs either. So the green is post, so where we've shown progress um, in increasing. Now you see that there has been an increase in males. Well, we've increased uh, the, the black male protagonists in our high school selections. And again, these books are in choice units, um, so students get to have a choice in what they read. And we've typically paired these with um, with a classic um, or a more traditional pre-approved you know, novel that's been approved you know, in, in the past 15 to 20 years. 
and we've seen that the female has really increased. So that's that's really exciting as well. So um, I know the high school teachers are, are happy. Um, I'm very happy for them, and hopefully this will translate to our kids finding more enjoyment in reading, especially at the secondary level. So I polled high schools um, just to see how these were going because we bought the text. Um, they were supposed to get professional development in August to, to show them how to teach a choice unit, and that did not happen. But nonetheless, some have persevered in offering these texts this year. Um, so I offered them um, a survey on which they were given a linear scale. So um, one, the answer one would be not at all on your left-hand side, and five would be extremely. So the first uh, question was to what extent did students enjoy having a choice between or among texts? There were six responses. A little bit of everything with, um, with two of them. Uh, it looks like somewhat enjoying it. So that tells me that I certainly have some work to do in, in the day that you decide on your text because there should be a whole day in looking into the text and learning about the author and learning about the plot and deciding whether or not you want to read it. To what extent did they finish it and enjoy it? Uh, well, again, I only got four responses, but the good news is that half of them mostly enjoyed it, so that's good. They were offered the first round of professional development to guide any conversations that might come up um, about race, especially race in, in school year 2020, 2021, um, or socioeconom and socioeconomic status as well, and Ms. Enzer helped me lead that one. Um, I got eight responses as to how or if that helped. Um, and again, half of those responses were it mostly helped. Uh, the score of three would be it helped. And I have two pe one person out there who it somewhat helped. So that tells me I do need to offer more support, more professional development on having conversations related to those topics or critical issues. Um, we did conduct feedback for the high schools uh, as they had gotten their first round of books and were getting ready to get their second round of books. Um, I have 13, 16 responses there. Again, on a scale of one through five, so with 13 of them feeling mostly or very um, prepared to facilitate a conversation, you know, as it came up on, uh, as a few of the books do have, have race and racism in them as a critical topic. Let me uh, ask you one quick question. Yes, sir. When these response, how many responses were we asked for? Or 24. 24. Okay. 24 so high school teachers. So that's what that, that's that, you only got. Oh, Pardon me, it, this slide that's up right now? No, the previous ones, like when this, I see the eight responses. Uh, 24, so we have, 24, we have so about 24 high school teachers. They're getting a very small percentage back. Yes, which was expected, again, because of the pandemic. They were supposed to be better supported by me in August with this is how you teach a choice unit. And so these were just you know some pioneers in doing it with doing their own research and deciding. So to the ones that took the initiative or ones that probably responded, the ones that did a little bit extra or what? Yes. Yes, but again, I take complete ownership for that. That no, you know, they, you they had them, and we said go ahead and do it. Um, but uh, that they do certainly need more support from my end, for sure. And I just put in some some honest comments. Um, you know, they're looking forward to them. This year it was just too hard to learn two or three more books that they would need to facilitate small literature circles or book clubs on. And but they're excited to do it next year. Uh, so next steps for the high school, as I've said, I need to provide more professional development on introducing choice text, on teaching them, um, on conversations related to family structure, socioeconomic status, health, and we need to work on um, units to support this so that they have lessons or lesson seeds to support their teaching of a choice unit. <clears throat> So middle school, which we're here for, to, uh, the books that I brought to you tonight are for middle school. Here's the enrollment data from 1920. So again, relatively even split uh, between the genders. Um, with uh, the, the white being the race, um, the predominant race um, in our middle schools, um, again, which is information that we know. Prior to um, the adoptions, we had 28 works among six courses. Again, we were looking at the same kind of statistic, um, mostly white protagonists. Again, they're the good guys and mostly male. So we had some work to do to make sure that our middle school students um, could see themselves in at least one, and I would love for it to be more, but that takes money, which I'll address uh, later on. Uh, in a book during middle school. 
so should the six books, uh, these are the books that have already been adopted, um, uh, two in ELA 6, although I might move the one to advanced ELA 7. Um, I am considering that, and then um, refugee which does, I admit, happen to be a personal favorite, um, has made its way into advanced ELA 8. And that's an incredible book if you're looking for a great, great read. These are the books I'm bringing to you tonight. Uh, so, uh, half of them are for ELA 6, so to really engage our sixth graders, which we know transitioning to middle school can be difficult um, enough. Um, two for our seventh graders um, and one for our eighth graders. Now the majority of these books, the recommendations came from the National Council for the Teachers of English, um, which is an annual conference up until COVID struck that, that we were able to attend. And the one we attended in 2019 was, all, was about spirited inquiry. Um, customizing, personalizing learning, and allowing students to have choice. Um, we were encouraged to look at our book lists, you know, as I've done, and look at our protagonists and make sure, are we able to answer the question, can all students see themselves in one book? So you know, we're taking our lead from our national organization, which we get our research and our practices from as a public school system. Um, so, and, and I also met with our librarians as well um, for, from the Queen Anne's County Public Library for any recommendations that they might have um, and took recommendations obviously from our teachers. And so the, the extensive document you have um, that we'll get to later on, I'll pause and hold for that. That's where all of this is, is laid out. So should those be adopted, um, we'll make great gains um, in having varying, varying text um, with different and diverse protagonists um, so that all our students can see themselves, have the opportunity to see themselves. Yes, um, you will see that male does increase, um, but it's because we have increased um, black male books with black male protagonists in them. Um, female has increased, um, but we have increased, we have a, we have a biracial female, um, so a multiracial female, um, and, a, and two Hispanic females. Um, so we've made great gains there um, for, for our girls and our girls of color. Same feedback I wanted to share, just complete transparency. They are just, they the, the three books that were adopted, they got around. I believe December, um, and so they have not had a chance to um, implement the books that they have, the, the three books that have been adopted into middle school. Um, they're going to next year, that first bullet, it looks like a team responded, so they're gonna read them this summer um, and get planning for next year. Uh, we gave the same PD on conversations on race and racism in your classroom, again, just an initial PD uh, to support them in that work. Uh, most of them feeling very, uh, that, that that professional development was very helpful. Uh, I gave the same presentation with um, Amanda Enzer, who was here with me tonight on socioeconomic status in school. <clears throat> Pardon me. And that uh, presentation, this is feedback from the middle school and the high school teachers, so about 48 or so. Uh, we got great feedback on that, on that collaborative PD. And I need to offer the same per, uh, next steps for my middle school teachers as well, future professional development and curriculum writing. Uh, so money. Uh, so in order to get one book per gender, um, per race across the district, these are the grand totals. And this is assuming that a book costs $22 per book, um, that we are adopting, that we are buying at least two class sets per school. And so that's a lot of money. I understand that. There was no way that I was going to ask for almost half a million dollars in order to do that. So in the budget that I submitted, I did ask for 80,000 to keep this going. Um, and that request I would make uh, over the course of the next of the next six years in order in order to meet to meet this need and to, and to offer choice and opportunity to all our students. Questions. <laughs> that was impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Keep going that that long and uh, <laughs> and that fast. But um, so the the competitive grant. Yes. In the last slide, you're asking for eighty thousand over the course of six years. The grant years. has run out. Okay. So now I thought you were on your third. Yes, we're at crunch. the very end of it. So this would be money that I would request. I don't, is it capital or operating? 
capital that, that I would need from capital to keep to buy novels. This is the first opportunity I've had to buy novels. I've had the, I've been here for five years, and there's never been money for them until we got the grant. I got you. Okay. So even under the grant, was it? When you say novels, are we talking strictly fiction, or was there an option for nonfiction? So we were able to. We there was an option. Yep, we have one nonfiction that's in uh, in twelfth grade English in English four called the Fifty Seven Bus, um, which documents an incident that occurred in twenty thirteen in Oakland, California, um, where a nine non binary person was set on fire by a juvenile on a bus. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is informational text. Okay, but you could get, for example, autobiography of someone if you're looking for a black male uh, uh, author yes. and protagonist. Yes. Uh, it could be an autobiography or something like that. Yes. Because I look at a lot of the titles, and I, I do do a little bit of research you know, on Amazon sure. and look at some of the reviews um, of the books that we've already purchased, okay. and, and I really haven't taken a look at those that are on this list now, and that'll be a question for in a few minutes how the public can access this list on the uh, internet or on our website. Um, so I was looking at your page six, I think it's this set, page six. Equity and Excellence in Maryland? Yes. Okay, and originally we were talking about the uh, educational equity section of the COMAR, mm -hmm. right? 13A.01, right. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I'm looking here, and it's the Guide to Educational Equity in Education. Now, this was the guide from Maryland State Department of Education, correct, yes. that they printed? Yes. So that's not actually part of the COMAR. This information on this slide is not part of COMAR. Okay. The guide was put in place to help us, and we always have to include information of how we're working to make to meet state or national goals when we write a grant. Okay. So when I was going to adopt books, I was looking at this guidance for local school systems and for the schools. Okay, and that's how you got the grant. I mean, that helped. It helps, and it every, you every quarter I have to turn in a report on what we're doing, what we purchased, and why we purchased it. Okay. So this as well supports that. All right, because on the last paragraph, um, a little red flag goes off in my head because I see <clears throat> example given uh, social justice standards, mm -hmm. anti-bias frameworks, and that kind of thing. Um, so just to be clear, there's no mention of social justice in the educational equity part of the COMAR, correct? Not, not that I'm aware of. Th right. That example that the state is giving is uh, different lenses you can use to look at your curriculum. So there are there are social justice standards out there. There is anti-racist curriculum. There is anti-bias framework for vetting, for looking at your curriculum to make sure it doesn't have those things. Those aren't things that, that we use here. I was just bringing in all the language from. Okay, but they do tend to, at least the books that purchased in the past, do tend to focus on race relations. Um, there are a few, yes. Religion, you know, Christianity, yes. the, the, the girl from Nigeria. Um, Purple hibiscus. Purple hibiscus. hibiscus, yes. Right, and... Yes. Uh, we don't elaborate on those. We don't, I, I don't uh, allow for them to wax rhapsodic on, on religion in a book. Okay. They can field questions as they come up, but our teachers always redirect them to talk to a religious leader in the community or their parents. All right. So um, I, I guess the, the best thing to do at this point, I mean, I understand totally where you're coming from, uh, especially now with the, the request for the 80,000. I, I can see yes, that that's the fund has run out. I, I thought these were the last tranche of the funds. Um, and so if you could, how do we access that? Is it on the website, these books that so are under review? They are, all six are over there. So my understanding with the MOI process is we, that I will send, you know the big document that you have that I have to address later that has what, what the committees did and what they come up with and why they approve it? Mm -hmm. That gets sent out to the public. So the public will be able to read all that. And then we house our books here um, for the public to come and take a look at. Okay, but can we get a list, just a list of the books? I don't need all the books, obviously. Uh, on the school website right. that will. people can you access? Will. You, ha you will have. Now, the 
being able to access the books is different, but uh, you will have a list of the titles. A list, yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the community can look and see what's yep. under review here. Yes, and they'll get the. Um, there's a letter that I write, that a cover letter, to um, to Mr. Smith and members of the board that comes okay. before all the information. There's a list on that letter. Okay, I understand. Yeah, and that goes out to the public <clears throat> once we say, okay, they can go out for, I bring it to you for information, they go out for a 30-day read, that hits the website tomorrow. Okay. That big document and the, here's the list of books goes out to the public tomorrow. And I so the that... list of books will just be in that big document? It's I... on the first page. Okay. So there's a letter to all of you that says, here's what we're doing, here's what we would like to have adopted, and the six are listed along with what I've paired them with, with what we've paired them with for the, the classical work. And then beyond that, there's about 30 pages about three or four per book where a MOI committee of an administrator, um, a specialist, a parent, a grade level parent, um, a teacher has reviewed the book and and they've looked at the, the critical issues in the book and they've said we'd like to, to see this adopted for that grade level. But getting back to budget. Yes. The 471,000. Mm -hmm. And you are asking every over the course of six years. So have you already? I asked for eighty thousand for the for this coming school year. Okay. So all these books won't be bought at one time. These six will be bought with remaining funds from the grant. Okay. So these six collectively to get them in middle schools, I uh, probably do about three or four class sets. Will be nineteen thousand, I believe, is on that yellow dot. I, I saw that it was nineteen. That's what I was asking you. Yes. Where that last is. slide is what I need to keep this going. What we need to keep this going to keep building our libraries, offering choice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Because I was going to, I mean, I asked this question, but the public will have an ability for 30 day review and they all should look at these books. Yes. Because sometimes these get adopted with no public input, it is input, but people don't look at it, then all of a sudden it shows up in the classroom and somebody has an issue about it. Also the thing is, if somebody does have a specific in the book that's not, there are alternative books that can be Absolutely. used. Absolutely, yes. So if a parent, you know, we, opt, we can opt out with the, with the student and then something else can be given to them if that's the wish of the, of the parent. Yes, we realize that every home is different and different in what they want their, their child to read. Um, in the professional development that I did provide, the, all teachers have been directed to let parents know this is a choice unit, here are the choices, and get in writing or in a Google survey from the parent that they understand this and they understand this is the book that their student chose. And, you know, it's and another I, support for choice. Now, I don't know that people aren't looking at them. I haven't had feedback on any of the other ones you know if there is an objection once they make their way into the classroom absolutely that yeah that, well yeah it's it just my short time here I find this comes up it's discussed somewhat some questions you asked and you answer them very very well thank you sir parents and aren't watching this and they need to look at these books that we're looking at to give us feedback they're great books I hope they do I know they should and see what their children are learning and what they can do for them mm -hmm. But also with the understanding is if there is one that finds it offensive or not in their beliefs, they can opt out for that and Absolutely. ask the teacher to do it. And that, that's, that's a policy. That's, that's always been the case. It's been a policy yes. of this. So yes. I think people have to understand that. Too. Yes. Absolutely. There was, I thought, very good synopsis of each book along with the action Great. sheet that we're getting. So that was very helpful. Good. Thank you. One thing I don't see on here, and as I'm scrolling through, is any of the uh, comments made by the people that were on your teams. You right. used to do that. They all agreed. So I'm. Oh, okay. So the the form that you're looking at now, I made because I wanted to be completely transparent with the community. We didn't have a form for fiction for works of fiction, okay. and I didn't think that was fair. So I want. So I had brought this to Mr. Paluski when he was here. I had talked to my reading specialist and English chairs, like, how can we let the community know? Okay, here's the book, and, and these critical issues are not new to these books. They, they they come up in in books for generations. But I thought it best to be transparent. Because so, I remember you had feedback on here before a couple times, some of them, well, maybe, maybe. There was one that I brought the feedback when they disagreed and I read it. Yes, yes you're that right. was through, it was two years ago. Right. And okay. so this, these, they all agree on, they all sign the forms and I have a big electronic folder with each MOI member signature on an individual form Thank that you. I can certainly give you access to if, if you need that proof. So just so I understand, so for example, 
obviously we have two 12th grade classes, right? Yes. Um, for high schools. So the English language arts, I guess it's level 12. Is that uh, four, they call it, yeah. Level four, okay. And so uh, do the English teachers get to set, I mean, if they don't, if an English teacher doesn't even want to entertain any of these They books, do not have to. They don't have to. I can't force a book to be read. I can just provide the support and the recommendations sure. that this is what you can do. Yep, okay. I can't force anything, and I would never. Right, and if a teacher says, uh, all right, I, I'm not going to, you know, we're going to look at another novel, um, okay. whatever it is. Okay, as long as it's approved, <laughs> as long as it's an approved, you can't go buy, you know, so, some novel that hasn't, that this, this community isn't aware of. Right. As long as it's approved, they can. Okay, all right. And so the ones that have been approved over the last 20 years, like you said, they can choose from those, right? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, no, that's fine. Thanks. <laughs> My this is just uh, uh, just in going through the the, tr pr the protagonist, the new adoptions. Just because you know multiracial is kind of the same percentage as you know black, Asian, and well even more than the Asian. And so, but there's no everything went up pretty much except there's nothing still multiracial in your high school. Was there just nothing that you in found? my high school? then there wasn't one adopted, then that's one of the things that I need to get if, if we can get me $80,000 so I can keep going. <laughs> Well, I just, there was a lot that went, that, there were a couple of the same percentages where your protagonist went up a lot. You know, you got, you had quite a few new adoptions, but there was nothing for your multiracial. For the high school, no, there was not. Okay. So I thought we do need to, to make that happen. And is there a consolidated list? You know I'm going to have a question. Is there like a consolidated list? <laughs> you're going to throw list? a snowball at me. <laughs> He's not going to hit you. I'm going to get suspended. <laughs> Is there a consolidated list of novels that have been approved over the last, you know, 20 years or, or whatever? I have a massive list of what's in our book rooms. Yes. What's, um, what I recommend to go with the curriculum is on our website that I have listed what's out there. Um, it's a, it's a really massive document, but if, the, if there's a book you're curious about, by all means, contact me and I'll let you well, know. I was just curious to the whole list. Uh, in our book yeah. room. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if there is a, I, I guess you're talking about a card catalog or, you know, just a PDF uh, of whatever. Yeah, uh, an Excel and spreadsheet. And you date yourself. a joke. But, <laughs> um, Do we just hold? Is there a chance I could get a, a look at that? Because if it's on the website, I'll, I'll probably never find it because it's right. difficult. You're going to go back to, to the Dewey Decimal System. The massive guy is yeah. not, but I can certainly share that with the, with the, the board. Um, and I send that to you when I copy Dr. Kanan. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, so it's got about seven tabs, and it lets you know what's in every book room. And yes, I will certainly get that to you. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate what you sent me last yes. time, too. Oh, gosh. Right. Isn't that overwhelming, all that stuff? For, that's another story I read for some another good day. First grade books. Yeah. All right. Mrs. Passon, thank you so much. It's thank so you. important that our thank children so have much. some choice and can identify themselves in the materials that they read. This is so important. We talked about this some years ago, and you are making it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. King. Thank, thank you, board members. All right. You too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, summer learning opportunities. Um, our presenters come forward. First, thank you again, Mrs. Passon. Thank you. And as promised, we talked to you, we said that we would share information about our summer learning programs, and we do have an extensive um, uh, program that we'll be offering this summer. We have with us Mr. Kevin Kentop, who's the program director for Arise Academy, also uh, supervises our digital learning. Um, we have Mrs. Michelle McNeil, which you, whom you've already met, one of our CNI supervisors, and Mr. Page, uh, who you've already met as well, another CNI supervisor. So thank you all for coming. Let's talk about summer learning. Well, good evening again. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Page. I am the supervisor of uh, science, PE, and health. 
and uh, environmental literacy. And we are here to discuss summer learning opportunities. And with me, I have Mr. Kevin Kintop and Mrs. Uh, Michelle McNeil. And the purpose of this is to share our proposed plan for summer learning opportunities in grades pre-K to 12. Going to start with um, pre K. Um, so, MSDE had shared with us the opportunity for a pre K enhancement grant. Um, this is a grant period that runs from March 1st, 2021 to December 31st, 2021. This will allow summer recovery for our pre K program for students entering kindergarten. The enrollment will consist of students who meet the criteria for economically disadvantaged and or have demonstrated to be at risk for school success. The curriculum that we're going to utilize during the summer program is a four week curriculum, 16 days of integrated instruction. It's gonna focus on literacy and math, integrated science, social studies, and physical development. It's also gonna include some conscious, conscious discipline strategies for social emotional development. In addition to the summer program, the grant money is going to run a little bit further past the summer, and we're gonna use that to have transitional support to kindergarten students who demonstrate areas of need. This additional support can be included with tutoring or small group support. That support would take place in September and October. Along with the summer recovery, we will be providing materials to continue learning at home for, with guidance for parents. That recovery um, materials would be in math and reading, focusing on counting and cardinality, um, books for home, and um, phonological materials. And just so you're aware, we have received um, our notice of grant approval for the pre-K enhancement grant um, already. So the next um, opportunity I'm gonna speak on um, is our migrant so summer program. Um, this is a program for our migrant students. We have about 100 students, infants to 11th grade, and our year one immigrants. This will take place July 6th through August 13th at Centerville Elementary School. Transportation is provided and it is funded through our Title I Part C, which is our migrant. Um, our focus is gonna be on ELA, math, and STEAM, which is our science, technology, arts, um, engineering, and math, and really focus on English language acquisition. And included in the program, we have some evening family engagement workshops um, to gauge our families with learning. Next, we're gonna discuss some of the universal opportunities uh, for all students in the county. As you know, we've re-upped uh, our contract with Exact Path and Admentum. We used that last year as a universal medication tool where every student has the ability to participate using the Exact Path program. It's very individualized. Our students will be allowed to use it again this summer as an acceleration for those that need it or for an intervention for students who may be behind in certain areas. Uh, if you recall, that program gives them an individual diagnostic so it sets their learning path for them through the summer and they can work on it at their their own pace on their own time. The second option is our Edmentum Custom Courses. And any course that we design in Edmentum for high school students or secondary students this year in middle school, we can put it out as an option for students to do on their own in the summer to prepare for the next grade level. So uh, a student may be in biology this year, they felt like they, weren't, they didn't do so great in it, they'd like to get a little boost with it. We will offer them our Edmentum Online Biology course that they can do themselves in summer just as a reinforcer to help get them ready for the next level course they're going into. Last year, we also created a custom SAT preparation course, and we will put that out to all high school students again, that they can participate in that to help build their SAT skills. And I do, and it's not on this uh, slide, and I apologize, but right before spring break, I did meet with Inmentum. They've also created seven new, what they call accelerated courses. And those accelerated courses are designed for English 9, 10, 11, and 12, and for Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and Geometry. And basically, they've picked out the essential skills for those courses and they've laid them out in a, in a shorter program that students can take before taking the class to kind of boost their readiness. So it's kind of an acceleration for someone coming into the class to get them ready for that. So this will be an opportunity for all students. Now next, 
we're going to talk about the kindergarten through 12th grade summer learning targeted program that we're going to do. So we've had some development going on so far this spring. We've had a team that met to develop a program outline and budget that we submitted for the ESSER II funding. Um, we have not heard yet back on ours, but we are waiting on that. So we submitted that. We had a committee of 10 members that included principals, administrators from all ends of the county, all grade levels, central office supervisors, P, uh, the PFY representative and so forth. So we've had this group that got together. We've decided that we we're gonna offer six sites in the summer. The four Title I schools, Southersville Elementary, Church Elementary, um, Graysonville Elementary, and Southersville Middle School will each have their programs attached, not only with ours, but what they might use for Title I funding. And then we're gonna have a center, Central County and South County location for targeted programming. So it'll probably be at Queen Anne's County High School and Ken Allen High School. We are collaborating with Title I, we're collaborating with the PFY program, and there are some programs outside of the school system like Horizons that are looking to work with us too with our summer program so that they can enhance things on their end. We are going to target students as our first priority. A targeted student is a student who may be behind according to our exact path diagnostic results at the end of the year. It may be someone that the principal and teachers have recommended needs to get some boost in order to be able to move on. Um, we will target those as our first invitations for the program and then we're gonna offer voluntary enrollment. So parents can let us know if they're interested in their child being part of the program and, and they can fill in additional spots for the program. In grades K through eight, we are focusing on an in-person instructional model focused on math and reading. We're gonna have two separate sessions, each lasting 16 days for three hours a day. In the high school, we're more towards our traditional summer school program. It'll be blended. It will use our Edmentum courses. Students can come in and be part of the program. We will be teaching some lessons, supporting them, but they will be using the online courses. And we're gonna run two concurrent sessions, 16 days of instruction for each of those sessions. Each session is two hours and 45 minutes. So that means a student who may need to earn two credits might come for a morning session and stay for an afternoon session to be part of both of them in the high school level. What we've done and what we need to do in order to prepare for this to happen is we have to develop the grade level reading and math programs for the K to eight program. We have our supervisors who have put together some um, frameworks and we're gonna have teachers develop those lessons. We wanna advertise as soon as we have the money to get teachers on board and start planning those lessons. We already have materials and text that we wanna use to support the program. So we're gonna purchase those so that we have them as part of the grant. We need to advertise and hire the staff for the program. I will tell you this is our biggest concern. It's over 100 and some teachers we're looking to hire for the summer. Um, and that'll allow us to have six different programs. I'm sorry, I'm sweating. It is hot in it here. Is hot. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, but that is gonna be one of our biggest concerns. It's been a tough year, the tough 15 months for everybody. Um, we wanna to try to get as many of our teachers involved in this program as we can. So we're gonna, as soon as we get the go, we're gonna advertise and start hiring staff for the programs. Um, then we're gonna identify all of our students. We're gonna put out a parent survey for those that wanna be a part of this, along with the teacher and the school uh, recommendations. And then the last thing we'll do in preparation is once we have kids in line, is talk with transportation. Because for the uh, elementary students, we're gonna do the door-to-door -door service and middle school students just like we do for regular school. At the high school level, we'll have pickup locations. They'll be at like, um, for the South County, it's usually like uh, Ken Allen High School and Graceville Elementary School, we'll pick them up there. And in the north end of the county at Southersville Middle School, we pick up students there. So that'll be part of our preparation. Some big things that we considered in this program for the summer is obviously what I just described, the transportation, but we're also gonna be serving one meal per day for every student. We're gonna have breakfast every day for any student who's part of any of our summer school programs. We have to employ nurses this year at all of our summer school sites, obviously for the normal illness or injury concerns and issues, but now with our advanced COVID protocols, we wanna have them on site to be able to handle all the issues with that. We are taking uh, into consideration all of our cleaning and sanitizing protocols that we need at the schools on a daily basis. We're taking a hard look at what we're gonna to need to provide staffing wise. Not just content teachers, but special educators and support staff because students are gonna need that support in the summer program like they do during the school year. Um, and then the last thing we put on there is sufficient technology provided when needed. 
We are really trying to, for the K to eight program, stay off the computers. We are trying to make this interactive, in the classroom, working, get off technology for a little while, and just try to get back into the quote normalcy of what a school setting would be like. We still may be using technology, but we'll make sure that we have that available to them you know, when that comes up. Big pieces to take in conclusion. You gonna hit that one? No. Okay. I, I, we talked about it outside, I'm sorry. Um, this is really gonna be the largest summer opportunity that our school system's ever offered. We're looking to project possibly six, 700 students that we're gonna to invite to be part of the program. And that's before our pre-K and migrant numbers are included in those types of things. So this is gonna be our largest project. Um, our plans are very fluid right now. We have to take and work. We don't have anything set in stone because we gotta see what kind of staffing we can get. We've got to look at how, as you see up there, adjustments by the CDC, MSDE, MDH, all those are going to play into how we can do things coming into the summer. And truly, staffing is going to be the key to making this work. I guess like you got it under control. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of moving, a lot of moving parts. Yeah. When, and it, it's a chicken and egg question, do we know times and dates? Because I know parents, you got, you're have two sessions, right, over the summer. When will people start getting firm times and dates? Because people make plans. I'm sure teachers are going to be asking you a question even now. Yes. Uh, what, what, I'll, I'll, I'll commit, but I, if you tell me when. Um, we have a calendar date set, um, and I don't have it written down in front of me. I apologize, but I think we said we we're going to try to start on June 17th with the first session for the K-8 to program, and it'll go to the middle of July, and then it'll go the very next day, start the next session to, I think it's August 13th. Um, a lot of this we're holding off until we know what funding and other pieces that we're just waiting on. And I, I actually was told that it could be sometime this week that we get all those things and we can start getting all that informa information out mm -hmm. to everyone. The, the students that need it the most, and once they're falling behind, is there, are we looking at some innovative ideas to try to make sure they come? Because, I mean, they're the ones that need it. I mean, they're going to get the targeted invitations. We are going to reach out to them directly. The principals are going to give us lists. We're going to use the data that we have off of the exact past diagnostics, and we're going to identify students, and we're, we're going to go to them and say, we have this program that we want you, we think you need, we strongly suggest, whatever terminology you want to use, but we want you in this program. So we're going to go to those families first first to pull them into the program. But, but then the other parents will be given an option if they feel their child needs extra help and stuff like that, they can voluntarily move in. They can voluntarily ask to be on the list. And once again, you know, we look at our spacing, our seating, our staffing, and we will try to plug in as many people as we can into those positions at, you know, for the program. And our turn station, we use our buses or our contract buses? or Just like we do for the school year. We use a combination of ours and contract Contracts, because okay. of the number of students we're going to need to transport. And this is coming out of the, fund, the second round of funding? S or two, yes. That's the $3 million that we just got allocated. Correct. Okay, so we the don't three, have a budget the, for this yet of any kind. For ours, we submitted a budget request in the program. It, went, it was submitted in the grant, yes. Mm -hmm. so I just released it. We, we've been allocated that money, just haven't released to your program. We haven't gotten a grant approval at this point. Oh, for the second one, we haven't yet. Can the, can the board members see this budget request? Can we see it? See you can see the on? application, absolutely. We'd be happy to share that with okay. you. Okay. So there'll be like June the 17th and another one starting in? Like July 15th, July 15th somewhere, okay. July 16th, somewhere in that So it'll range. be a 30, two 30 day. It'll be two 16 day, because remember in the summer we were open four days a week, Monday through okay. Thursday. So it'll be a four week. It'll be like a four-week program, right? We have to watch out for July 5th, which is a holiday this year on a Monday. But yes, we're we're going to have Monday to Thursday because Friday's a correct. And parents that have questions, who should they address them to right now? I would assume that would probably be me. Um, yeah, they, but but give us a minute because this is this is what the plan is. The dates are are established. The hours, just like we just presented. What we're waiting for is one, the approval, the money to come through, the funding, and two, then we will start advertising for staffing. So, you know, we love to open the doors wide open, but if we don't get the number of teachers that we need, 
then you know there will be some limitations. But you know, normally what it is is we're going to have a coordinator for each one of these sites that's written in the grant, and we'll put somebody parents in touch with that coordinator. They'll have, they'll have a contact yeah. at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, we, we yes, we did budget for an, a, a contact at each site that'll be run, oh, kind of overseeing the daily day to day during the program. Because I just find, I mean, I, I know you can't commit now because you don't, you haven't got the grant yet. You don't know what staffing you're going to have, but people will have questions. Absolutely, and that's you know, and, and, and hopefully get answered so they they can make a good decision too and get these kids in here and up to speed. I would say we have a number of things sitting in the starting gate, and as soon as we get to go ahead, we're going to start building curriculum, start hiring folks, and all that. So it's it's ready to go. Just we need to go ahead to say the money's there. Gotcha. Any other question? question about transportation. So if, if I want my child to do one of these, he's not an invite, but I want him in there, but he only needs like the afternoon session. I'm going to have to transport him for for a high school program. For a high school program. No, we run a the way we run the high school program is there is a morning run that brings them to the first session, then there is a, a second run that brings kids in for the afternoon and then takes the morning kids home, okay. and then there's one that leaves after the second session to take students home. Okay, thank you. So, how much was this budget that was sent in? I I did not see the final number that went because there was some editing done on some. Yeah, I, I can't recall the, the exact amount for the summer learning because we have PPE in there, but this was the grant that was for $3 million. So there's PPE in there, there's summer learning. Summer learning was the big, it's a significant um, number. yeah, it was the big, uh, you know, this, expense. And this grant was supposed to last us for three years. We were supposed to spend it over three years. And so we're going to be two. We're going to be spending it all for this summer learning. No, we, no, no, it's, it's, no, it's not the whole years. thing. Like when we submitted our budget, there was not there was concern. We had to put in money for the food service that we wanted to take care of because we didn't know if they were going to extend the free uh, meals program like we've been using this year. So money like that has to go in until we know if something gets carried over. And I believe since then we may have heard that, so there was some adjustment in the funding of that. So I don't know the exact final number. Um, it, it's a large chunk, but it's not. It's it's no more. It's it's definitely not even half of the money, I don't believe, but it's it's a large number. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Great information. Okay, you want to take a 10-minute break? Mm-hmm. Okay, we're back. Our next report will be Human Resources and Substitute Bus Driver Report. I make a motion to accept the human resource officer and sub bus, substitute bus driver report as presented in closed session. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it 5 out. Uh, transportation report, new bus purchases. I make a motion no, to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you make the motion, then you have the discussion, and then you can have the vote. Make a motion. All right. I make a motion to accept the transportation report that Ms. Poole and Ms. Gamery show us. Second. Okay, you're on. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. For the record, my name is Carla Pullen. I am the interim chief operating officer. Uh, per our LLC transportation contract, any buses that are 13, 14, or 15 years of age are eligible for replacement. These are coming before you this evening because it will give us a change in the PVA, which is the vehicle allowance that is paid per the contract. So we have three 15-year buses that are proposed to be replaced, four buses that will be uh, replaced by used buses that will be purchased and they will go with the PVA that's listed. So it will be the year um, of the bus that will be the PVA that will be changed to for those specific contracts. Okay. So, from 2020 to 2021, there was a 1.8% increase. 21 to 22 will be a 1.4% increase. So the PVA for a new bus for 2021, 2022 is 20,000. And then it's prorated based on the age of the bus from there. So we'll have, have we covered this increase in this budget that's been proposed? Only 5,000 of it. Um, five. There are five, five buses that are proposed for new. So at this point we have three 
okay. that have been reported, the others will not have that high a PVA. So we'll stay within the budget that we've, okay, thank you. We believe we will, yes. Any other questions? Call for a vote, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Pollard. Transfer request. President Smith, Dr. Kane, and board members. Tonight we bring before you a transfer request for budget amendment two. The first one is for administration to transfer to the contract account of 109510 and then mid-level administration, those instructional salaries to the mid-level to reclassify it to the correct account in category. Okay. Totaling 70000 Okay, the question I would have is the, the transfer, uh, and it says increase legal fees. Yes. Do we have a little list of that uh, the board could see or anything? Uh, yes, I do have it in front of me here that I can make copies and share okay. to you with everyone this evening. And that was sent earlier today when copies you requested were? it? Yes. When was it sent? An email was sent out. Through to us today? Yes. Yeah. You asked for it this morning. I think we got the message from Mrs. Wright and we right. sent it to you. Okay, I didn't have time to look at that email. I didn't. I didn't see that email at all. Did anybody else see it? No. I haven't looked. I think it was just sent to you. Just sent to me? Mr. Smith, but we can make sure everyone else gets a copy of that as well. well let me go, let me see where it looks. And in addition, I can go make copies of this right now too. Yeah, we, I, I would, but other member, I, I'd like to see it. I'm sure other members would too. <sighs> Thank you. Ms. Thank Ray. you, Jackie. I'd also like to ask a question is, what is the, uh, pardon me, the instructional salaries to mid-level administration salaries, who does, what is that for, the 70,000? That is the Title I coordinator that was under instructional salaries, and being a coordinator, they fall under mid-level administration. So it's just a reclass from instructional wages up to your mid-level administration. This person was uh, was grant funded before. Uh, no, it actually was. This person actually was fully rest, um, unrestricted, and we're able to get a portion of her salary restricted and unrestricted because they do more than just the Title One. Oh, so it falls under different categories, yes. and that's okay. That's where you're. Yeah, we did talk about that when we were going through the budget, and we, we made that account mm -hmm. for next year for fiscal year 22. This gets in line fiscal year 21. Who's? I mean, I don't have the copy. I mean, I I don't have that email in my thing. And, and the, you sent it to Queen Anne's County. My. I, I sent it to Dr. King. So it's not so much as an increase as it is just reclassifying. The second one's reclassifying it okay. within uh, or between categories. Okay, thank you. And the first one is between it um, taken from savings from utilities and moving it into contracted service under administration for legal fees. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Send at 1054. I'll resend it. Like right in its step child. Thank you. The approved budget for legal fees under administration was 70,000 to, to start off the year. And as you can see, to date, we're at 123. Thank you, ma'am. If we account for the current trend, that's where the budget request comes in at 109,510. at last year and it was around 90, 92,000 for legal and administration. So you're projecting it out to be that? Yes, at the current trend times four months, yes.
I have time to look at this? On, on the Carney one, that's the one that the president would either Tammy had done it or I up to this time, March the 25th. The other ones, I guess, Dr. Kane, that would be ones you've used or had for the school system. Correct. Did you want to table this for our next meeting in April? Oh, if you need to do it. I mean, do you need to do it now? Uh, no, uh, just before it gets into the negative, the administration gets into the negative. Which, We're not I mean, allowed to have a negative category. Any board member suggestions? I just, I, during my tenure as president, I never saw any of the... No, no, no. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is you or I saw whatever, like the 10, 20, or 8, 20 up to the, by December, you probably saw. And after... Uh, there are a few on here that I never saw. For Carney? Uh, no, for, for Chandler. So... Uh, well, I no, I, I haven't seen Chandler. I know. I think we need to table this, please. And, of and do it at the work session, please. Yes. Okay. Right. Motion. Thank you. Any motion to table this until the next work session? Second. Second. Thank you. Motion. Any further discussion? Can you call up my role, Ms. Uh, Wright? I will. Board members, please respond once I call your name. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Mr. Chivanelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? <clears throat> yes. Morissette? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. It will be tabled until is it the next meeting or when did you say? To the next work session. Thank you. Until the work session on the 21st. Thank you. Next, next will be April 21st. Okay. Our next thing would be math renewal contracts. again for the record Amy Smith's mathematics supervisor and gifted and talented are the questions so we, we have a couple of contracts here there is a um, where do you want to start you want to start with math 180 or? Um, that's fine um, for the math 180 contract that is our current um, intervention program for the middle schools grades six through eight and so that's just our usual program that we use to continue an uh, annual renewal process for that contract and then we also are bringing forward agile minds for and agile renewal. minds is our core learning um, curricular component for grades six seven geometry and algebra two both of these are continuations of programs that are already in existence. Agile Minds for $91,508 with um, FY22 um, 22, um, budget. And this is, we recognize that we have not gotten a re an approval just yet for the FY22 budget. We wanted to put this in front of you um, right now so that when the approval does happen, we can go ahead and get moving and we don't waste time waiting for the next meeting. So this will be contingent upon approval. The the math 180 and the amount of uh, $31,908.08. That is also a renewal. That one we would be using operating funds from the current year. So those funds are already in existence. The first, the Adrill Mine Educational Holding um, for, of 91,508, which will be the next year's operating budget. Uh, do I have a motion to approve depending on the budget source? Is that what we're? It would be operating FY22. FY22, upon approval FY22 budget. Do I have a second for discussion? I'll second it. Okay. Who's made it? Well, 
Okay. I'm bringing it in. So moved. Okay. <laughs> Seconded. Okay. For, for purpose of discussion, mm -hmm. it needs to state, our, our motion needs to stay, say that upon approval of the 2021-22 budget, because we don't even know if we're going to have the money enough to spend it on this. Well, that, I maybe didn't speak Good. loud enough, but I thought I said budget source operating FY 2022 upon approval of that budget. Okay, thank you. Also, to are we are these sole source? Yes. Okay, so we don't. How do we, how do we procure them? You, you mean going out for like a bid process? Yes, or that kind for of the thing? bid processes. Uh, because we have been in the former contracts and this is the kind of an extension renewal as far as, but it's now year to year that we have to go through. Okay. Um, and we and, that. and we haven't looked at anything else? This is there, is, there has not been an adoption committee to bring that forward to do other um, reviews of the intervention tools or the current ones. Last year, if you remember, we did um, grade eight and algebra one. That's right. For text adoption. Yes. Because we have to phase them in as far as where our budgets are at. Any other questions by the board? I have a motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 5-0. The next one will be uh, Math 180 Renewal. Um, HMH Math 180 Contract Renewal in order to provide students with mathematics intervention, appropriate resources, and support grade level mathematics for the sum of $31,900.08. It is in the current operating budget, FY 2021. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you Smith. too. Okay, informational items. Put my thing on here. Let's make sure I'm in the right page. Good evening, start right off. Good evening. So I am here again this evening to discuss with you the contract that we have with Sodexo, which is our food service provider. This contract was successfully bid and awarded in 2019 with an option to renew four times. So that would give us a total of a five-year contract. For this year, we are in the second going into year three. This will be our second renewal going into year three. We are recommending renewal for the 21-22 school year with an increase of 3.4% to the management fee. So this essentially covers the uh, cost of the raise in minimum wage for Sodexo and for their employees. The total cost of the increase is $6,950.12. It is sustainable after reviewing with Mrs. Towers with the fund balance that has been accrued in our food service amounts and budget. And so we're here this evening to make you aware, to give you an opportunity to ask questions, um, but just to let you know that we are hoping to approve that and to give a renewal and extension to this contract. So in years past, we've been in the negative on that food service balance. So now all of a sudden we have a... We were not last year. Last year we were... We, we did have um, a surplus, and last year we approved a 3.7% increase as well. So this is actually less of an, inc an increase than what was afforded last year. How did, we, how did they operate this year with us not being in school? Did, they, did everything turn out all right? It did. I think it's been difficult for them. It's very much been a roller coaster. So they've prepared to have all of their staff back. And then we have, uh, in November, decided that it wasn't safe. So then they were to lay people off again. Um, there have been times when they've ordered food for us to be back in the buildings. And then we are not coming back in the numbers that we have suggested. And therefore, there has been um, 
some ways that they've had to repurpose food. Thankfully, much of it freezes and they were able to reuse it at a later date. So this has been a roller coaster year for Sodexo. Um, they've been great partners with us. They have come up with new and innovative ways to reach the families that really do need food service and to um, just stick right alongside with us through this year, unprecedented year. Because it, don't we guarantee them so much? We do. Yeah. So there are two parts of the contract. There's the management fee, which would receive the 3.4% increase. And then there's a guarantee on the sale of food. So we have a guarantee number that we provide to them. Anything over and above does go into our food balance account. Yeah. But uh, correct me, did we... We didn't get the money back on all the food that we gave away during COVID during la last year, 2020. That I can't speak to just because it was not in my wheelhouse okay. at that time, but okay. I can get some information. I know that there was um, something that had to do with, with the reimbursements and I can get you information on that, but I do believe that we've recouped yeah, I, I from that, that time. I think that we did, but we can double check for you, but I think okay. there was a long pause in there where we were waiting and we were waiting. And maybe that's it, what happened and it just didn't come through until later. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But as long as we have given them the 143000 in sales, which whether they're handing it out at the in the parking lot or they're handing it out in the classroom, I mean, it's still sales. Yes. That's correct. Okay. And are we pretty much, I mean, I know the state or federal government was reimbursing a lot of did that. Is that going pretty good or? Yes. So at this point, we know that we will be serving uh, the free meals through September 30th. We still don't know what will happen after that time, but that will be extended into the new school year. And that at that time, we'll reassess. Is that for all students? That's correct. For all students. For September 30th. Yes. And that's with our summer meal program, which is what we've been utilizing throughout this year. Well, we know before so we go back to school in the fall, how long it'll be. I mean, it just seems odd to get them back in and then pull the rug out from under them 30 days later. I'd rather, I, you know what I mean, start with. We felt the same way and we inquired about that. And essentially it's been extended that far because we want to make sure that we give families enough time to get in and submit their applications for free and reduced meals. If you recall, we've had a whole lap in a year's time now that we do not have current applications on file. So we wanted to make sure so and, want, and that's... You want to get it back in school and That's do what that. that time accounts for, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Any other questions? I make a motion to accept the Sodexo Food Service Contract Extension for FY21-22 for the amount of $211,365.60. Have a second. Second. All those. Any any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Ayes carried. Five zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Cullen. Okay. Expenditure reports. Back again here. <laughs> We like seeing Thank you. Thank goodness. <laughs> Probably next month see a lot of you. <laughs> uh, this evening we have before you the expenditure status report by category. As you can see in total, the available balance as of, as of the end of March 31st was a little over 12.6 million. And the breakdown is as such listed. Next year's budgetary purposes, when do you think you have a handle on what fund balance we could possibly have at the end of the year? And I know it's, you know, it's been an odd year, so it could be tricky, but um, you know, we're going to, you know, we're presenting tomorrow night to the commissioners. We'll find out what's funding from the county. We know what the state and federal is. Um, I'm always worry about using fund balance, but if we have fund balance this year, at least know if it's going to be in a negative or positive way. Right. I, I think the goal was May or June's okay. meeting that we can kind of review that. Okay. Um, Ms. Harper has um, tasked us for open positions and any savings, so we're actually working on that now. So we should have that in May or June. 
when, when did the commissioner strike their budget? When do they strike their budget? It'll be toward the end of May. End of May, so. They have to do it by the end of June, so. Okay. You know, it's like everything else. Like some things come in late, some things are on the front loaded. Right, right. And like the Verizon hotspots, just draw your attention to that. Dr. Kane and I were talking about that today. The technology grant and broadband, broadband grant ended March 31st. And that covered a lot of our hotspots. In addition to the technology grant that ended 1231, there's a reopening grant that we have applied for and, and that. Um, we got allocated 404,000. That will help offset that cost of those hot spots till the end of June. If not, it would have had to been picked up and, and unrestricted at that point. So our hot spots will be paid for at the end of June. Through the end of June, with the reopening grant for 404,000 uh, in total. There's other things that we can a lot, but it's right around 150 for the hot spots. I mean, our systems now back four days full with virtual on, and some students still doing virtual, but that at the end of this year will change. The little gadgets, do we get them all back? Yes, they are ours to keep. To keep? Yes. So, but they're numbered so we know who has them? Yes. So the parents and the students bring them back? Yes, they have their own identifiable number. But after, Probably June, after the end of this year, they won't. I say when the year end of this school year, they won't be needing them any longer Correct. that we know of. And then turn that in. monthly, they'll turn them in. Yes. And we'll have seven or eight hundred hotspots. Right. But we will have to turn off the Wi-Fi to them. Yes. We have to. We have to cancel the contract. Which right now is being paid for by a grant. Correct. Yeah. Right. That's what and I'm then saying. The in June. Up. In June. The, the connection goes dead, right. and the, hot, the physical hotspot comes back to the board. Yes. And then we see what we do with them at that point. Yes, Mr. Coombs and I have had that conversation. It's a big box. Will that be done prior to end of school? As a, we're seeing some that aren't being used, they are being um, shut off and asked to return. So okay. we're starting to see it slowly trickled in from what I'm hearing. but. As the end of June, they'll all be required to be. I, mean, I just imagine after the students aren't in school, it's get, it's not going to be easier to get them back. Exactly. You know. He has a plan in place. He's had to get those back. Gotcha. Thank you. But I imagine next school year, some some of our students are still going to need yeah. access to those for homework and. And some may still need access over the summer because we, as you just heard, we're still going to have exact path available for families if they want to use it. But, that's, but that's, that might be a direct cost to this board, though. So I think that if, if the school district decides that they want to continue to allow the use of the hotspot, but the family has to pay for the Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. you might want to think about right. that. Right. They could keep the physical machine, but pay. Now, if they did that, would they, I mean, because it was $20 or pretty reasonable price for mm -hmm. the hotspot. Spot. Mm -hmm. 30. 30. Yeah. I mean, that's cheaper than I'm paying at my house. Yeah. So they would, would it, they wouldn't, they're going to bill us. They want to bill us and we bill the parents. They're not going to want to. Right. Um, Mr. Combs has. I mean, got some options. School, yes. He has an option through power school where he can bill the parent. And we have been working behind the scenes to set up on school funds online. We're getting ready to roll it out where parents will have the option to pay online where they don't have to send money into school with the student. They'll actually be able to log in and submit the funds that electronically and the ones that don't have that ability will make some other arrangements for they can pay at the school yes okay okay thank you any other questions for the The next one we have before you is a transfer notice, and this is within the category. So within the transportation category, we are asking to move 12,000 from supplies, and that savings from fuel to vehicle insurance. It actually increased last year, and we need to account for that for 12,000. Now, is that, is that for our buses or contractor buses? That's, that's for our buses. Our buses. And you'll notice that that's the negative that's on, under the transportation line item here. And then the next one is maintenance of plant. We have savings in salaries. We like to move that to contracted services for 50,000. And that was for the remediation services at the middle school. Do 
Don't we have any funds in the building funds left over anywhere to pay for the remediation? Past building funds anywhere? It might be under, is there any in capital, Carla? I'm not sure if that qualifies or not because that's repair and maintenance specific, I think. That's why I'm, that's what I'm asking that's is check. with coming out of salaries when, I mean, it's not. It's a one-time thing. So it's salary savings. It's a one-time savings this year that we have in uh, maintenance that we'd like to use for the contracted services. We can assess some of the county only funds for some of the past building projects that have recently uh, culminated to see if there's any savings. The state funds that are allotted toward that wouldn't be eligible. Yeah, no. Okay. Sure. Yeah, because they're they're specific. Yes. Project Thank specific. You. Any other questions? Do you have a motion to approve? You don't have to, that's just for information. All right, aren't you gonna send a letter to Chris? I thought I saw a letter for Chris. Uh, that's the one we're postponing to talk about next time we meet. Gotcha, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Apologies for second review. Uh, First one, promotion and retention of students. Mr. Evans? Oh, you got this one, Ms. McNeil? Um, promotion and retention, yes. Yeah, okay. All right. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members and executive team. For the record, I am Michelle McNeil, supervisor of early learning, Title I, Title Three, and migrant education. I have before you um, the retention, promotion and retention policy 632 and promotion and retention um, regulation 632.1 for second public review. Are there any questions? Has everybody had a chance to look at this and review it? I did. Do we have any comments on that? There was one comment um, asking that um, was wondering about to define satisfactory level. Um, the regulation was too vague using satisfactory level. That was the only comment. How could we address that? Um, well, I um, looked at some other regulations um, within the state and a lot of them have used um, the terminology of performing according to expectations. So it wasn't satisfactory is at the elementary, middle, high schools more to specific credits. So, um, you know, it's, it's based on, you know, their performance, their report cards with their standards, if they're meeting their standards. Um, so it depends on how in depth we wanna go. Um, but like I said, when I looked at some others, um, Montgomery, um, and Anne Arundel, it talked about performing, um, students who are not report, performing according to expectations. Um, so so if, if we changed it to that, would we have to put it out again for first read in order, if we made changes to it now? No, that would just, that's just part of the process. So you okay. would, if your committee meets and, and you make that change, if that's what's approved, then that's what would happen next. Okay. Well, if, if the committee policy if, committee is not meeting until the 21st, right? But this is going to go out. This is going to go out for second read. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. So you still have an opportunity to get comments. Okay. Any other questions? No. I make a motion to um, send out for second read promotion and retention policy number 631 with regulation 630. Uh, I'm sorry, 632 and regulation 632.1. I hear a second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Five oh, ayes have it. Go for. Thank you. He's going to go back to policy for that change though. We'll, look at it. Well, um, I'll email to figure out that now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 638 student behavior intervention. Good evening, 
President Smith, Dr. Kane, board members, executive team. For the record, my name is Jolene Smith, Supervisor of Special Education. Um, I bring before you policy 638 and regulation 638.1 for um, second read. There were a few comments. Um, opinions. Um, one was related to the timeliness of the submission. We actually started the process for this uh, revision to take place in 2019, but because of COVID and everything else that kind of transpired, it got delayed. Um, so I, I recognize that that one comment was made. And then the other comments were related to the training that goes into place. So all of our staff are trained in verbal and physical de-escalation techniques. It's always encouraged and actually it's in the policy that we will use the least intrusive method before we ever go to anything more intrusive. Um, and we only deem, we only use what is deemed to be appropriate for the instance um, that occurs. As I noted with the red line, this is an existing policy. It's just some verbiage that was being changed. Any other questions? Any questions? No. Okay, it's at second read. Do I have a motion to? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, all those in favor, send it back, send it out for final. Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Five. Mr. Talon? I said I. Sorry. Right. <clears throat> gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next one will be policy number uh, 648, uh, educational equity. Good evening, President Smith, Dr. Kane, members of the board, executive team. For the record, my name is Matt Evans, supervisor of student services. Uh, we have before you the Educational Equity Policy 648 and Regulation 648.1 for the second read. There were, a oops, there were 123 comments. Um, I did go through the comments and really looked for common themes and, uh, and made some tallies. So in summary, uh, if the comment, well, first I want to say that some comments touched on more than one theme, so there might be represented more than one area, and some didn't really address the policy directly, so they weren't, weren't counted at all. Um, 36 in the comment specifically said yes. 36 specifically said no to the policy in the comment. Uh, 13 responses said that we need to identify inequities in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. 13 comments had, had said that the policy is divisive. Um, 10 comments stated the policy is required by the state. Uh, nine comments stated that there's racism in the Queen Anne's County community. Eight comments stated the policy is important for Queen Anne's County. Seven comments stated that Queen Anne's County Public Schools is behind other systems in the state regarding equity. Five comments disliked social identifiers in the policy. Five comments felt the, the policy promotes political indoctrination and activism. Four comments represented that equity training is needed for parents and staff. Uh, three comments uh, referenced that the policy is racist. Three comments mentioned uh, specific lines to be amended, and that was in the regulation, and I have them listed there, B number seven, number 10, C number one, number 13, and 18. Uh, three comments disliked the term implicit bias. Two comments felt the, the policy promotes critical race theory, and two comments um, felt there was a concern regarding teacher diversity in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I also noticed the word boilerplate came up a couple times in some of the comments. They keep saying that we just boilerplated what you know Maryland, what MSD put out, and that we, we didn't. It wasn't um, reflective of Queen Anne's County. Um, also, and I agree that the, the expanding the expectations, maybe calling them desired outcomes rather than. You know, or you know, make calling it something else. We we talked about that in the policy committee. Right. Making making it um, an expectation, or you know, um, 
what we'd like to see in the system, the school system. Um, I just received uh, Mr. Uh, Burns's um, notes on it. He, he's just getting it to us, and there was some corrections in that as well uh, that he's recommending. So um, I don't know how to move forward with this. I think uh, <clears throat> given the amount of co uh, comments and uh, Mr. Burns just gave us his input, and I know all the board members have looked at this, um, you know, in detail, uh, I've made a lot of uh, comments in PDF form. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to, uh, I'm not sure of the word, if we can pull this, send it back to the committee. Ms. Harper? You don't, you don't need to pull for, it. <clears throat> That's what these reads are for. You give your comments to Ms. Harper because she's, she represents the board on the committee and the committee discusses whatever it is that they need to discuss. They consider the comments that are made by Mr. Burns and they move forward with whatever it is that they come to consensus to present uh, for the next um, time. So you still got another until the next board meeting for the second read and you make your changes, get them to the public policy committee. Well, would a suggestion be that we, we've had comments that you review, but not, I guess, with the whole po policy committee? Are they, has a policy, po policy committee seen all the comments and talked about them? No, we have not met regarding the comments. Well, no. it, it, but a suggestion be that we take it back to the policy committee as it's written now with and incorporate whatever you feel and the policy committee feels with comments both from board members, uh, Darren and everybody involved and then we'll bring back, bring back for second read next month. Okay. Well, as Dr. Kane just said, we send it out for second read now. <clears throat> And you make all, your changes. And make the changes and then sh come back next month with whatever version that we're that well then, 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 then I'm, all I'm trying to do is bring it back for a second read next month so the, the public ha can see it have time to look that, at it we have time to look at it and then it can we could do a final vote in we can still send it out now mm -hmm. right. we can still make the changes when we come back next month if it is revised in such a way we'll send that out for first read for first read yes because if we make significant changes in it it needs to go back out to first read to go back out to the public. Okay. I mean, we have to be transparent about this. I'm all for that. Okay. I mean, I, there's, you know, so, this, so is, what, this is a community issue. This is, this is, this is what we have to do for our district. Okay. So we'll, we'll send it back to the committee at, after the second read. Yes. And uh, if there's major changes and we'll have to address it at that time. Yes. All right. So hang on. So this is second read, right? Right now. Yes. And so. When's the committee meet again? The 21st. Okay, and you're gonna take all the comments and all the yes. recommendations from the board? I, I'm asking Matt, yes? Can, okay. Yes, I have all the public comments and I have Mr. Burns' email as well. Okay. All right, and if it's significantly changed, it's gonna come back, or when we meet again for the third review, it's actually going to be a second or it'd first be a, reading. What I'm, what I'm hearing is it'd be if a, it's so changed. It'd be a, if it's significant changes, then you have to come back and go for a first review and then work through the process. If again. It, yeah, again. Go through again. And I mean, and yeah. the only thing I can, I'm, it, I'm not on the policy committee, but there does seem like an awful lot of uh, contention and comments on this thing, so it looks like it could be changed. But, but that's the policy. Well, that's what I was thinking, yeah. So, And then we vote on it. If, 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 if there's no changes, then it gets voted up or down next meeting anyway. Right. And that, that it, if the policy feels they don't need to change anything. Yeah. Okay. Make a motion to send out uh, education equity policy number 648 and its regulation 648.1 for second, re second review. Second. And we, and for, as far as the discussion, that's going to have a second review, but it's going to, the policy committee is going to note, notes the comments that have been made by various groups to, to look at this on April the 21st, you said, Tammy? Yes, and we have a work session that night. Okay. Okay. Ms. Ray, can you call roll? I will. Mrs. Spinelli? Yes. Ms. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Morsat? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Marlin? Please. 
Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Evans. Thank you. Thank you. It's very important as Queen Anne's County is the only school district in the state that does not have an adopted equity policy, education equity yes, policy. Yes, yes. And I, I did have that slide if that, if that question came up. We are, um, we're the only, all, all districts in the state have adopted a policy at this point. Well, we we got to take our time. And you know, uh, Matt, I asked you, I think the last meeting for the MABE uh, template that you used or that, can you send that to me? Because I, I haven't received it. So it is in the, um, yes. So I have in that slide, no, actually it was in the, uh, it's linked in the earlier slide I did. In oh, was it? The okay. presentation was uh, this forward. If it's linked, then I can, I can find it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Textbooks for adoption, public review, math. Miss Amy Smith or Michael Page. I'm Amy Smith, supervisor K-12 mathematics and gifted and talented. What you have before you is review for textbook adoption. We, um, despite the COVID experience, we were able to bring in a textbook <coughs> review committee and reviewed several different textbooks for our elementary. The committee chose the iReady Classroom Mathematics that has a textbook resource as well as an online resource for students. And we are looking to have it reviewed to implement for grades three, four, and five, the intermediate grade levels in elementary school for the fall. Um, the program comes with a consumable text for six years as well as an online component program and for the first year of implementation um, iReady is providing us with the diagno full diagnostic assessment and a learning pathway for each of the students as a helpful tool for this last year and a half um, resource that is actually directed right at the elementary level and pathway to move students forward if they're progressing again age appropriate where we found exact paths sometimes at that particularly intermediate grade level kind of push them beyond really where their scope of extension should have gone so that's what we're looking at for this one the textbooks are over there for public review all grades three four and five the text resources offered language components for um, our ELL students. So it had translations in Spanish as well as some other versions um, if needed that we could reach out and be able to tap in. It also provides learning resources for our teachers full grade level in the elementary scope. So while we're implementing grades three through five, part of the component is they are provided the curriculum from K to five so that within the classroom, teachers have the ability to be able to differentiate and support students learning throughout. And that is a total dollar amount of $276,454.79. From capital of this year, do we have that, Miss Towers? I'm sorry to ask you. Uh, I believe it's from, op isn't it from operating this year? No, it's it is, no, no, it's it is capital. capital. That's right, mm -hmm. capital. Capital 2021. Do we have right. that? And yes. okay. And so this we're putting out for review. For public review information, and then after the 30 days of public review, we'll bring it back for uh, possible approval. And the public can, I mean, it's going to be. Yes, the text resources are over there as well as the write up from the review committee and um, the pieces that they found, the strength components. Um, it also provides them a resource link to be able to view samples of some of the online supports that students would be using. I'm making motion to adopt the I Ready Classroom fiscal impact of $276,454.79 from the FY 2021 20, capital budget. Do I have a second? 
Amendment. This is this, this is not. I apologize. Adoption. Yes. I amend, maybe amend my amend my motion. That's it's still out there to put out for public review the I ready classroom. And and you don't and you don't need a vote to put it out for for review. Gotcha. This is all for information. Okay. And when we when we bring it back after we've gotten comments and and you know whatnot, then we'll then we'll need that motion. Okay. So okay. Great. This, this so could like, come so back in our this could come back in our May meeting. Yeah. Early. I mean, that's, it, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And then we'll, at that time, we'll have the write up and all the stuff. And at that time, it'll be an action item for us to be able to approve for use of the budget. And uh, the same thing I'm assuming happens where you have a chair, a couple teachers, and a so citizen. our review committee had um, administrators, teacher specialists, several teachers from different areas around the county that were involved in the review. And they were the ones that had the voice. I simply facilitate conversations and they went through using a rubric tool to evaluate what would best support them and um, recognizing that our elementary teachers have done a phenomenal phenomenal job and they've done it without text resource for just about five years now so they've been working very diligent using our curriculum resources but it's a lot of copying and then with the virtual world it's been a lot of development of materials so that it can be used both simultaneously online as well as in the classroom. And so this resource, one, helps that planning component, but it also allows that transition between both face-to-face -face and some virtual components for students who are still going to need those virtual transitions going through. And the evaluation form is in your board docs. You have that and it, along with the folks who were on the committee. On the, on the committee. See, I was just trying to buy them outright. I was just trying to beat the gun, man. <laughs> I'm with you, Ms. Harper. <laughs> let's just buy them all. Let's go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thanks for sticking around. My pleasure. Mr. Page. Just go. That's my book. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening again. My name is Michael Page. I am the supervisor of science, PE, and health, and environmental literacy. And today I bring forward a uh, textbook adoption for public review for our earth science textbook in high school. Uh, our science department is requesting funds in order to purchase the Lab Aids EDC Earth Science textbook and its associated resources to replace the existing textbook. The current textbook is not aligned with our state standards or the next generation science standards and is 16 years old. So today I would like to put this forward for public review. Okay, and the same thing, it could be available to the public to look at. Yes, sir. I, su I suggest everybody look at it if they, <laughs> you know, they need to. And give us feedback if there's any questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wade. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. And we have Mrs. Passon back again for her secondary novels. And hers don't cost as much. No, they don't, and they're from a grant. <laughs> okay, good evening, uh, members of the board. Dr. Kane, the executive team. Again, my name is Bridget Passon. I'm the ELA supervisor for grades three through 12. Um, tonight, I am bringing forward uh, six books for uh, public review into uh, middle school curriculum. Uh, Amina's Voice by Hannah Khan, Ghost by Jason Reynolds, Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly, The Crossover by Kwame Alexander, Harbor Me by Jack and Woodson and rebound by Kwame Alexander. This is pretty much what we heard earlier from you, so. Yes. Like I said, my only opinion is please read them. You know, you guys do a lot of work looking at this stuff. Um, you know, we talk about characters and people and how people look at different things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the citizens need to know and look at this stuff because, um, you know, we're five people up here making these decisions and you're recommending them to us, but everybody needs to be involved. I think it can make a lot better end product if yes, everybody understands. the good news is, is that there's uh, parents from each of the middle schools have served mm -hmm. on these committees. Right. So they're already out talking to, you know, other parent friends in the group about the books. Um, we've had, you know, we had a school, you know, write one and put one in. So. 
hopefully there's already a buzz about them. I certainly hope that people will take the time to read them. They are all wonderful. Uh, Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Good Hassan. night. Get home safely. Thank Good night. You. Okay. Let her to buy a new bus. Good evening once again. So as part of our bus fleet for Queen Anne's County Public Schools, these are our county owned buses. When the vehicles reach 15 years of age, we're mandated to replace them. We do have funding requested for fiscal year 2022 for a bus purchase, but to have that bus ready by August for our 21-22 school year, we typically issue a letter of intent to the vendor now to make sure that that order is placed and in production. July 1st, 2022, 2021 provided that funding is included in our allotment from the commissioners, then we will issue a formal purchase order. All of this will be contingent upon funding. This is just for your information. There's okay. nothing to do. And the funding's coming out of capital? Yes, the funding is requested in capital. In capital? Yes. But I will make the caveat that this is one of our special needs buses that must be replaced. So if this is not funded by the commissioners in the line item that we've requested, which is our new bus purchase, we will have to take a look at how we could accommodate that otherwise. How many buses do we own? Do we own the, the county? I mean, how many do we have at the warehouse? So we have 20, 25? It's in the area of 30. 30? Mm -hmm. So basically, every we're going to buy a bus, one or, one or two buses a year. Yes. Typically, in it's one or two. This year, it's one. I think in the last couple of years, it's been two. Um, there were a few, uh, several years ago, we got ahead of the curve and bought two when they were at their 14 year and then two when they were at 15 years. So we weren't bombarding everyone with four in one year. But, but a point of reference to the commissioners is it's going to look like one bus a year to maybe two. Yes. It, over a three-year period, it might be zero, but it's going to average at least one a year. That's right. And, and we would like to look out and project that as well so that we're keeping on that one per year. So again, if we have one that's 14 years, we'll try and replace it so we're not overwhelming. And I think that'd be good to, you know, and I can or Dr. Kane can explain to the commissioners that in capital, or you can when you're there, that, you know, this is an ongoing thing yes. and we're trying to space it out, not, you know, four years of zero and then all of a sudden need eight buses. Yes. You know, so that's something. Okay. That's correct. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Thanks, Colin. Okay. Our next uh, work session will be April the 21st of this month. We'll have a board meeting on May the 5th and another work session on May the 19th. Um, all board members, did they get a copy of the attended next year's schedule and everybody see that? Uh, maybe we can look at that and give Jackie some feedback or go with that. Okay, so I have a motion to adjourn our regular meeting. And go into I make a motion to reconvene in closed session. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Five vote passes. Thank you. Good evening.